Hey everybody, my name is Aiden Mattis. Welcome back to the Weird Bible Podcast. I'm of course joined by Wendigoon, the Lord of Giants. Hello, um, hello. Who, if I remember correctly, uh, just had a pretty important life milestone as a creator. Uh, what what just ended? I did. So I just got um, the Kickstarter for the first movie I'm ever working on funded. The live stream's playing through my phone. That's Oops. fine. I did. <laughs> um, so I had started a Kickstarter along with the writer and director of the SCP films. Uh, and we're doing a movie set within the Stalker video game universe. And our goal on that was like a quarter million dollars. It was 255000 which is an obscure amount. We were all afraid that we weren't going to hit it. And it just finished today at 320000 So Lord. you guys uh, are fantastic, incredible. I'm so excited to show you what we have in store. It's going to be really cool. And also, the day that we hit the funding uh, requirement, the Stalker video game company... Uh, message just and said that they're excited to see it which is really cool um so it's just a lot of really cool things happening all thanks to you guys and i couldn't be more grateful for it so sincerely thank you for your support um thank you for being here it means the world you guys are fantastic i'm so excited for you that's gonna be so much fun and i can't wait to see it i'm 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 looking forward to it coming out <laughs> oh i'm so ready i remember we were in the discord chat talking whenever we started going over budget and uh, one of the producers was like, you know, this means we can get like gore packets now. And I just, I was flipping out. I was like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> just gore losing my mind. Time. Yeah. Because <laughs> I always wanted to do what they do in the old, uh, I always just wanted to see it happen. In the old like action movies, whenever someone gets shot, so they detonate a small explosive <laughs> on them. And it, oh, I want to do it so bad. And now we can. I'm so pumped. I love that, that, that it's just like, you know, everybody else is like, oh, sweet, we can do all this stuff. And you're like, gore packet. Gore packet. <laughs> exactly what you need every time. Oh, uh, man. I've, I've been so hyped just listening to producers be like, because spoiler it's going to be get pretty intense at certain parts i mean it's it's like you know these giant teeth dangerous monsters in like a supernatural realm it's going to get bloody so we were like factoring up like okay this guy's going to need two pints this guy's going to need like a gallon like to figure everything out and by the end of it it's like yeah just get like a, a truck <laughs> Full of fake viscera. That should do it. <laughs> Truck full of fake viscera. Yeah. Good lord. That sounds like a Cannibal Corpse song name. <laughs> Something but yeah, that anyway. said blood for the blood god. <laughs> it's perfect. But yeah, anyway, Jesus, the Bible. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, speaking of gore packets, um, Moses turns an entire river to blood in this story, and that river is the Nile. So that actually works out. <laughs> it links into each other. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. But before we get to that part, I wanted to start with, as we normally do with this, setting the scene and history of where exactly all of this is happening. Because I, I think people don't get quite the necessary scale for how old Egypt is. Um, a lot of people make ha have them the assumption, the misunderstanding that the Jews built the pyramids. The Jews did not build the pyramids. The pyramids had already been there for about a thousand years when the Jews got to Egypt. So Egypt is old as hell. We're talking 3000 BC is the beginning of the old kingdom in Egypt. So, and that is it. That is an empire that continues in existence as its own thing until 332 BC. It is a 2,700-year period where Egypt is ruling itself. That is longer than any other country in the existence of humanity, un unless you uh, like break it up into the kingdoms and whatnot. But nobody really conquers it, with the exception of a couple periods of less than 100 years, one of which actually happens while the Jews are there. So... Uh, last we talked about this section of the Bible, I think we were covering uh, Genesis and Joseph and all of that. Traditionally, Joseph and his, his entrance into Egypt have been dated closer to the 19th century BC, but the evidence is coming forward to suggest that if that 400-year time period is correct between where in Exodus, I think it's what, 1240-ish, uh, somewhere in there? That uh, they it says that they were in Israel. They were the Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. Yeah, if we follow, uh, yeah, I think that's right. If we follow that yeah. timeline, mm -hmm. that puts Joseph getting there uh, in the mid 1600s BC. So, what we find is that there is a pharaoh who does not know Joseph. That is where this begins, and 
that has a very interesting period because Joseph comes in about when the Hyksos take over Egypt. The Hyksos are West Asians. They're Asiatic. We don't get exactly who they are, but it's believed they were Semitic speaking and they have names like Yahub. So they might actually have been Canaanites who would have been recognizable to the Jews, but they would not have known Joseph. There is a Pharaoh who comes up during this period who does not know Joseph. And it seems like that might be Semken uh, because the timing just works out. But what you end up getting is this verse at the very beginning where we hear that there's a Pharaoh that does not know Joseph and he starts to get uncomfortable with how many Jews there are, how powerful the Jews are, and decides that they need to be subjugated. He needs to teach them a lesson. And so he has them kind of become a second class of citizen. They are instructed to help build the cities of uh, Pitham and Ramses, which were built during the reign of uh, Ramses II, which is why the traditional date of the, the exodus happening in the 1500s bc can't be correct if they actually built these cities then it must have the exodus must come after 1225 bc so when we get in oh i just realized that the chat is in completely the wrong spot it's fine but yeah so that's where the story starts so i does that okay a dumb child brain that's just <laughs> like you know metastasized over the years into whatever this is um as a kid i always remember thinking in my head the time between joseph to the exodus was like four or five hundred years mm -hmm. that lines up to the scale you're saying right yep. now right okay all right yeah that's where i was because, going with it because i've heard that people have guessed the exodus was 1500 but for what you just said about the city of ramses that doesn't make sense. And also it doesn't make sense that in a hundred years, the second in command of all of Egypt would not be remembered. Exactly. That doesn't line up. So yeah. It's gotta okay. be a longer period of time. And on top of that, for example, uh, the battle of Megiddo does not involve the Israelites. There is no mention of Israelites there. And that happens in the 1400s. That is the first recorded battle in history. Uh, we know that there were battles before that, but that's the first one to actually get written down in, in detail. Mm -hmm. We have the numbers of chariots, even. We have who was involved, the names of the kings. We have that it was Thutmose III, I think, um, who was commanding the Egyptian forces. We know all of that. And there is no mention of people who call themselves Israel, uh, which is... But there is on the Merneptah Stella, which shows up uh, in 1207 or 1206. It's the fifth year of Merneptah's reign. It talks about how Israel is defeated, his uh, seed laid to waste, and it, it's it's very interesting because the rest of this Stella where they're talking about this war against the nine bows, uh, who are the Sea Peoples, um, in this in this moment, I love the Sea Peoples. We're gonna talk I about know. the Sea Peoples tonight. <laughs> it's so wild, um, so cool. All right, yeah. Cool. <laughs> so he talks about how in the War of the Nine Bows, uh, every other country is listed as its or their or like referred to as a country. Israel is referenced with male pronouns. So it's very clear oh, that... interesting. They're talking about something completely different. They're talking about a tribe, a people. They're not talking about a country when they're talking about Israel. And it says they're laid waste. It says that they're gone and they've been handled, which is exactly what an Egyptian monarch trying to cover up the fact that he just let 600,000 people escape across an ocean uh, would say. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of how the Egyptians and the Romans and the Greeks all did things. They didn't really report their defeats as defeats. They found a way to spin it into a victory no matter what happened. You know, something interesting along that line, I was doing research into, like, Roman history. Mm -hmm. And the reason, it turned, you know about this more than I do, but the reason we know about a lot of daily Roman attributes or of shameful defeats or shameful situations is from court cases. Mm -hmm. Because, like, they didn't want to write down, you know, all their losses or all the, like, daily menial stuff they did. But whenever it would come up in, like, a legal system, they would have to record it directly. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 they just did it. Which is kind of like a Sigma male mindset, <laughs> if you think about it. It's like, oh, we lost. Didn't happen. Yeah. And, and I'm not... I'm exactly. not writing it down. Prove it. <laughs> well, and, and Caesar is probably the most guilty of it of all time, is that he just did not report a single one of his defeats in Gaul. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember hearing that. It's like he got eviscerated. Every and few times. Officially, yeah, and officially they never lost. <laughs> exactly. There's, there's, and there's no record. 
There's no official <laughs> record. Oh, um, your tribe doesn't have a written language? That sucks. Anyway. <laughs> and that's Undefeated, back-to-back -back champs. That's arguably, like, the only reason we know about this event is that the Jews wrote it down. <laughs> Like, <laughs> Egypt, Egypt were the only people in the region really writing anything down at the time, and by the region I mean specifically Egypt, whereas the uh, the people of like Canaan had just kind of started to come up with Phoenician script. Um, Sumerian and uh, Akkadian and all of those languages that use cuneiform, those were already in practice, but that was far away. Uh, so what you're dealing with here is like the only reason we know anything about the exodus happening is because the jews wrote it down and at that point it's like the jews versus the egyptians on whether or not this happened and you're just taking someone's word for it and for a long time the argument was that nothing about the torah had been written down before the 7th century bc but in one of these recent ones we talked about the uh the um, mount ebal tablet which appears to have been dated to around 1200 bc which is just making my it's making me more and more certain that I'm correct about the dating here. Um, you know, it's it's fun to it's fun to find like have an idea and then people who are actually doing science somewhere else start to confirm it, and I just get to sit here and be like, ha ha. That's that's historians, by the way. That's what we do is we wait for the archaeologists to do the work and then we interpret it. <laughs> Aiden, I can't wait for uh, thirty years from now when you're the head of some department, <laughs> and it's and it's just like this is Aiden, the guy who everyone made fun of because they called him crazy. But it turns out the Clinton's actually had a, ch a baby sacrifice m monument in their home. He was right the whole time. Who would have guessed? Totally correct. Dude, we, <laughs> we hit the Clinton body count conspiracy on a Twitch stream the other day. I was worried I was going to oh, get murked. Uh, <laughs> what, yeah. what is the total body? Hold up. Just, what is the total it's body like, count now? It's like 56 people. It. It's like 56 yeah, people. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. But yeah, so, so to bring things back to what we were talking about... Um, I have my notes in front of me now. Uh, but yeah, so this this story of the Jews being forced to build Pitham and uh, Ramses could possibly have turned them into a very adept class of artisans and craftsmen. Um, I would be lying if I said that as a Freemason, we don't kind of use this as symbolism. We do. Um, but the what you're looking at here is a group of people who were forced into servitude and as a result, became extraordinarily skilled, rich, and powerful within society. So what do you do when a group of people who you tried to uh, force into submission and give them the jobs you didn't want become richer and more powerful than you? Genocide. Um, so that's what's <laughs> ordered. Uh, and and they order the Pharaoh orders that the male children, uh, that the midwives when children are born, that the male ones just be drowned or hit with a rock or something like that. And nobody <laughs> does it. And, uh, well, some people do it, but particularly Moses' mother does not do it. And this becomes extremely <laughs> significant because this symbolism gets repeated over and over and over and over and over in the Bible. Um, you know, I can't think of the examples off the top of my head, absolutely, but there is one in Exodus where we get later into the plagues and God's just like, hey, remember when you did that thing? I'm gonna do that thing to you. Um, which I, I love, I, I do love how petty God can be at sometimes. Whoa, hold on. I never <laughs> connected the symbolism on that. Just as the children were slaughtered and one was spared. So was the, ah, yeah. whoa, I never, I never put that together. God yeah, kills all duh. the firstborn of Pharaoh and spares his own. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes whoa. the symbolism is kind of like in the background and sometimes the Bible comes in, just slaps you in the face with it. Yeah, that was, that was a slap in the face. I just didn't catch it till now. Interesting. Yeah. A lot of this stuff did not occur to me until this week when I was like reading and taking notes on it. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's really a fascinating book the more like, oh, yeah. you dig yeah, into it. And these, these plagues and the double entendres and the symbolism within everything. Um, but I, if you, I if you take the time to like wrap your head around it, the Pentateuch is like some of the most interesting writings ever, like in human history. Oh, yeah. And, and there are certain parts in here. We'll get to one of them, but um, where I had to go and talk to an Orthodox priest, because I was like, I'm, I'm so lost. I cannot find a single Protestant pastor. I don't trust the Catholics. Father Peter, tell me. Explain. Uh, I don't trust the Catholic. <laughs> it's that math, it's that Baptist yeah. upbringing, you know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I I wanted to. I think the first point here, where you can really start to connect things back to the New Testament, also is where we get to Moses's birth. Um, and it is 
the story, and I love the irony in it of how his mother gets involved, but Moses is born during this period when everybody is supposed to be killed. All the firstborn sons are supposed to be killed, which if you look at it, there's another time when, so, when a king orders all the firstborn sons to be killed. Mm. Mm. Connections. Mm. So Moses is born. Moses, one of the, the primary prophets, pro- arguably the most important prophet in all of Jewish history, um, comes and he's born during a time when all the firstborn, uh, all, the, all the boys actually, not just the firstborn, so all the boys are being killed. And then when Christ is born, Herod has ordered all of the boys, I think it's under two years old, right? Yes. Yeah. Orders all of them killed. So you get those those branching symbolisms where the the story of the New Testament will do its best in every possible case to refer back to one in the Old Testament. And I think that's fascinating. But uh, do you remember the, the irony about Moses' mom? Um, you'll, you'll have to <laughs> remind me of it. Yeah, because so, it just occurred to me like today while I was doing this. Um, okay. Moses' mom doesn't want to kill him, so she hides him for a few months, but eventually he gets too too big for her to hide anymore, so she sets him into an ark and lets him float down the river, where he is picked up by a daughter of the pharaoh, who then, recognizing this is a Hebrew baby, doesn't want to kill it, uh, and hires a nurse to care for the baby, who turns out to be yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Moses' mom, <laughs> which I just, I love that bit of, like, because... It's one of those things that, like, I don't, I don't know how much of the Bible is symbolism, but I really hope that one is true. I hope that that's mm-hmm. a real story because it, the, it's just perfect. Well, I'd say it is because whenever he's with Aaron and Miriam later in life, they talk about uh, growing up with their mother together, right? Oh, yeah, Which means right. Moses had to grow up with her. So yeah, I believe it's true. Um, I think it's a beautiful picture. It's similar to Hannah and Eli. Now Hannah prayed for a baby, and then despite giving it to God, she gave it to God, and God gave it back. So, like, in this situation, Moses' mother uh, gives him away. It says she prays over him, asks that he'll be safe, because he'll be killed if she stays with, if he stays with her. So she pushes him down the river, and God's divinity is over him. He goes to the palace, and then in her faith of giving Moses to God, God gives him back to her. And she's left come in. Same with Hannah and Eli. Same with Mary, honestly. Um, and several other mothers seen throughout the Bible. I think that that's one thing that does get... I think the Catholic Church does a good job of it. And it gets overlooked, I think, a lot by Protestants particularly. The importance of women in the Bible. And, mm-hmm. and motherhood. And just how, like, at every turn, every single important person in the Bible is at some point, like, either saved by or encouraged by their mother, their sister, their wife... Uh, mm. including Moses, because the thing that I was going to get to as we as we get through here is there's an episode where uh, God God tries to kill Moses. Um, and it's not yes, so much yeah. God tries to kill Moses as God's like, you know, I'm going to make you think you're going to die so that you'll do something right. And yeah. his, his wife Very, saves him. Yes, exactly. Very similar to a uh, Jacob wrestling with God. It's not that Jacob was had the potential to beat God in a fist fight. It was it was that God was letting him like keep it up as long as he wanted to, essentially. It's very um, fatherly. Like, it is, yeah. Like you let your kid like take it out on you. Mm-hmm. Even like you obviously, you know, Jacob or Moses isn't gonna be able to do anything. But it's the fact that you just let them play it out and see the consequences of their own actions. I was gonna mention about the women thing real quick. I don't know if it's so much Protestantism. As much as it is modern applications of Protestantism, because every time I look at like an old writing that came from Protestant, like whenever uh, I read Paradise Lost by John Milton, he was very forward about the importance of women Mm -hmm. throughout history and in the Bible. So much so that in his story, whenever the angels meet Eve, they all bow before and said, blessed be the countenance of God that is women. Um, so there's like this holy nature that's been built up with women in the Bible. Well, biblical, biblical viewpoints of women, there you go, throughout history that I think's only been lost pretty recently. But if you look a little bit back, it's still there in full effect, I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it, it maybe a 
too swift to blame my own sect of Christianity, but I, I yeah. think it's yeah, watch it. I, I would agree that I think it's a oh, bit more the, the modern, uh, the modern yeah. sense of things. I think that that's there. That, I mean, obviously, this is not an episode about that, but the there are some <laughs> churches out there who are really not doing the best they could do. I will also say that I think uh, it it may not be directed against like women specifically. I think it's just a lot of modern interpretations have forgotten a mm. lot of things about the Bible. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot that gets left out. I think I think yeah. the, the story is like Ruth and Esther need to be more more pushed to the front, in my opinion. And we'll cover them at some point. I want to get through as much as we can over the yeah. over the time we have. But I. Uh, you know, but in this case, it's it's the Pharaoh's daughter who rescues Moses, and it's Moses' mother who cares for him. And uh, this upbringing is very interesting, in my opinion, because timing-wise, this would have to be during the reign of Ramses II. Ramses II had a whole bunch of kids, like a, a lot of kids, at, like 13 kids, um, sons, let alone daughters. And it was, I think, the 13th one who eventually becomes Pharaoh. Uh, but Moses would have grown up with the uh, with Merneptah and with Merneptah's successor. So Merneptah, who is the pharaoh, who's, in my opinion, the pharaoh in Exodus, who is uh, going through all the plagues and denying Moses and the Jews the ability to leave, they would have known each other personally. Doesn't it say... No. There's a solid chance I'm getting mixed up with the Prince You're of fine. Egypt movie. Uh, yeah, the Prince of Egypt movie is a horrible. great movie, not the most accurate. Correct, correct, <laughs> correct. I, I still love it, though. I cry every time. But isn't um, doesn't it say in Exodus that they greet each other as friends when Moses returns? I think so. I would have to look at it. I just burned the hell out of my tongue, so hang on. Uh, <laughs> I made tea job. and immediately put it into a... Uh, a travel mug forgot how you're long this would stay hot. Funny. And now I feel immense pain. I am being punished for my, uh, my pride. And the brand <laughs> will manifest a sponsorship. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of thermoses, <laughs> I do have coffee. Um, but let me, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, while we do I, this, I mean, I also, I also have one. I can. I don't yeah. have to send you on all the fetch quests by yourself. <laughs> Just got my my KJB out. Um, I mean, that would make oh, sense in much. my opinion. Um, because they would like they would know each other, but I think so. I think they at least they greet each other like they know each other, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. If you want to look for it, while I deal yeah, with the yeah. fact you that my mouth is I currently keep, on fire. I keep de- I keep derailing you. You be fine, productive. You're, fine. You're, you're you have important things to say. <laughs> Uh, well, that's debatable. But, <laughs> but uh, before we even get to that episode where where Moses is greeting Pharaoh, um, the the episode that causes everything is actually Moses having to take a stand and choose which people he's going to identify with because he's grown up at the Egyptian court and he's been adopted into the Egyptian family. He is he is a prince of Egypt. Um, and in the ancient world, adoption held a much higher standing than it does in the modern world, much because our, we don't really look at adopted kids as different than um, kids we've had anymore. But back then, you were in a position where the, uh, the adoption was almost more preferential than being born to somebody. So if you were the Pharaoh's child, their offspring, then you were not chosen. You just existed. Whereas an adoption was you were hand selecting a child. You were saying, you particularly, I like you, you're important, I'm gonna I want you in my family. So it was almost even more prestigious than being born to somebody to be adopted by a pharaoh. And the Roman emperors actually took that same practice. They would very rarely choose their own biological child to be the next emperor they would adopt somebody like caesar adopted octavian and marcus aurelius should absolutely have adopted someone other than commodus you you look deep in thought have you discovered your your passage i'm i'm getting there continue please (laughs) Uh, i'm also listening (laughs) yeah so the the moment that moses really i don't want to say like he was never jewish but the moment that he chooses to be jewish that he chooses between Egypt and Israel is when he sees an Egyptian beating a Jewish man. 
And when nobody's looking, he goes over and he kills the, the Egyptian. And he hides his body in the sand, and he thinks he's gotten away with it. And the very next day, he he's out for a walk, and he's greeted by two Jewish men who are like, oh, are you going to kill us too? And he kind of feels like, oh, wait, I'm no longer, I've, I've now sided, I've thrown my lot in with the Jews, but the Jews don't want me, so what can I do? And he chooses. What, what a couple of losers, too, by the way. <laughs> like... You uh, you watch your boy get beat, and then someone kills the guy beating him. You're like, oh, okay, so Rude, I see. Right? How that, yeah, like, what's your problem? <laughs> God, absolutely no gang loyalty here. Uh for real. Good That's lord. kind of the motto of Exodus. Yeah. <laughs> Good lord. Um, so, so anyway, Moses flees to Midian, which is actually across the Red Sea, and it's in uh, northwestern Arabia. And that, in my opinion, is interesting because Midian is actually the uh, half-brother of Isaac. And he goes and he establishes his kingdom south of Edom, and He's actually in this position where it's, uh, you know, he's not one of the two Isaac and Ishmael. He's just another half brother. He's a son uh, by uh, Keturah, uh, one of Abraham, Abraham's second wife, whereas Ishmael is a son via mistress. And so you get the whole story of the elder shall serve the younger, um, and that the Arabians and the Jews have been fighting over that ever since. Uh, understandably so. Be I, I would be a little upset too if like my great 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 many greats grandfather was like you know what I like you better um, and I still have to deal with the consequences today uh so a little bit of animosity back there I get it I remember I had a friend who didn't really know all the history of stuff ask me why that is the thing like why they still want to kill each other I said well imagine that. You thought God gave you like a giant piece of land and said that you it's yours by God given right and to kill anyone who tries to take it. And you and your brother both <laughs> think both that think you that. got the exact same <laughs> yeah. message. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> it's like, you know what? This might cause some problems. <laughs> I got some problems, yeah. Yeah. Pretty um, much. Uh good old modern geopolitical problems that date back to <laughs> Checks Watch 2000 BC. Um Jeez. Uh but yeah, so the the next thing that happens here, and in my opinion, while this all is supposed to be a true story telling you the history of who Moses is and everything, there is never a an op uh God does not miss an opportunity to explain some sort of moral message here. And the first thing that Moses does when he gets to Midian is he sees a group of shepherds harassing a group of women. And he goes and he helps the women to carry the water that they were supposed to go get for their flock, for their father. And, you know, make, basically keeps them safe. And traditionally at this point, Moses is 40 years old. Now, you know, you can determine for yourself whether you think that Moses actually lived to be 120 or if he had three sections of his life that were broken into 40 for symbolism reasons. Either way, it doesn't really matter. This is the point at which the second third of Moses' life begins, and it begins with him aiding people in need for absolutely no reason. He has no tie to these people. He just sees these are people in need. I'm going to help them, and he does that, and for that, he is rewarded with uh, Zipporah, his his wife by the priest whose name is escaping me at the moment. Um, I don't know if you recall it, but that's the, the problem is the Midianites don't practice circumcision. And that leads us to this episode with, with God. But before we get to that point, uh, there's, there's the burning bush and I would like you to explain the burning bush. Cause I think you'll do a better job of it than I will. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> better's debatable. Uh, so Moses, at this point, he's living out in the wilderness. He's fled Egypt because, as we said again, no gang loyalty. No gang um, loyalty. He's, he's out in the wilderness, and God has decided that he will be, Moses will be the one who will lead his people out of Egypt, that it's time for them to develop their own nation to the land that God had promised Abraham generations before. So God calls on Moses, and Moses sees the visit, it says he comes across a burning bush, but the bush is not consumed. So it's a bush that's on fire, or the closest thing that we can equate to it, and it just stays on fire, but it's not burning up. It's kind of like this. A lot of the time in the Old Testament, you'll hear images of angels or God represented as these bright, fiery, burning things. Um, 
And that's essentially what Moses has come across. So whenever he goes to the bush, he speaks to it and says, I mean, I can pull up the exact verse if you want me to, because I'm right here. Uh, got it in front of you. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Just just to make sure I get the wording right. Um, a brick. Yeah, there's the part where he kills him. All right. I, I realize this is very lame to be looking. No, you're fine. Did you, there's a whole did you chapter where thing about up. Moses and the Pharaoh meeting each other. Yeah, so I think that was just fan fiction. <laughs> I think I just was misconstruing it. Uh, it could be mentioned in Numbers because Numbers looks over yeah, a lot of the true. events of Exodus and uh, tells on them more. Like whenever you read Exodus and it gets to the part where Moses strikes the rock, it's mm -hmm. just like, and Moses, the rock, and then they kept traveling and there's no more context. But then you get to Numbers and you get the whole story of how it was a betrayal and whatnot. I kind of imagine, uh, like, Moses writing all of this down as being, like, he finishes Genesis, and then he's like, all right, now I got to really get across, like, the main points of, of of the rest of it, and then he comes back and he's like, all right, time to flesh this out. <laughs> yes, pretty much, but yeah. I feel like that's how I, that, that series of events happened. I, a lot of the Bible's like that. Uh, Acts is similar. Acts was written by Luke as, like, a direct account of everything that the apostles went through. And then you read, like... Paul's retelling of certain events, and you're like, oh, that was a lot more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, there are several parts of the Bible that are like that. So yeah, anyway, so it says he's tending to a flock um, of Jethro, his father-in-law. Jethro, A right. priest of J Jethro, that's it, the priest of Midian that you mentioned. Sick name. Uh, and, I know, right? <laughs> and it says, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon the Lord. Again, another commonality seen throughout a lot of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by the reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hiveites and the Jebusites. Uh, now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. And he continues on, God continues to talk in the following verses. But essentially, uh, whenever Abraham was called to be the chosen essentially a uh, vehicle of God throughout the Old Testament, that his people would be God's people. He was promised that his children would inevitably inherit this beautiful land, a land flowing with milk of honey. Uh, and at this current point in history, the Israelites are being enslaved by the Egyptians. So he tells Moses, now's the time, go get them, take them out of Egypt. They're going to go to the land I promised Abraham. Uh, which is the setup for the rest of the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. So th at that point, uh, Moses is very scared, and I don't know how far you want me to go into it, but he, uh, God performed several miracles in front of Moses because despite seeing the burning bush and hearing the voice of God, Moses is like, I don't know. To be fair, <laughs> to, be fair to Moses, like, if you came across a burning bush and it told you it was God, would you not, like... <laughs> worry about your own sanity would you like you need some physical like prodding you know? that's fair like, that, that, I, that is fair i cannot blame moses for the, the awe <laughs> i also think that a lot of the people in the old testament that this leads into my whole theory that um creatures uh supernatural entities were much more common back then so Things like a Bernie Bush may have not been at insanely out of place. True. And he could have been like, look, I saw 
I saw some like witches floating last week. You're gonna you're gonna that, have to do better. I mean, that's a good point. <laughs> Almost immediately after this, Aaron throws a rod at the ground and it turns into a snake. So I, oh, I yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I did want to dig a, into that's something everyone forgets that despite Aaron throwing his rod at the ground and it becoming snakes, Pharaoh sorcerers did the exact same yeah. thing. Now Aaron's eight theirs, which is symbolic of God's power. But they still had the power to make snakes. Which so... is a theological thing I want to get into in a minute. But I did want to talk a little bit about the theology behind this. Because Abraham is promised the promised land, right? And he's right. in he's in Canaan when, like, he settles there. So why do you think, like, what what's your thoughts on why the Jews leave? Like, is it, are they disobeying oh. God by leaving during a famine? Or... Yes, yes, it's actually mentioned. Um, oh man, I'm ah uh, ah. Uh, if you would have asked me at any other point, I could have given you, you the detail. Someone in between Joseph and Abraham. I mean, there's only like three people. It's Jacob and Isaac. I know. <laughs> I'm almost. I'm almost positive. It's Jacob's the one that leaves Canaan. Jacob. Correct. They leave. Some, yeah, that's why he fought God, right? He was like, no, I want to go away and be with this other group. I will admit I that uh, I got kind of bored about Jacob and maybe skimmed his story. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure what happens is God's like, no, you're going to be provided for right here. Like, this is the promised land. This is the land I gave to your father Abraham to stick around. So Jacob's like, nah, there's uh, – well, Jacob was the one who worked for seven years to marry Right. I believe so. I don't think that was Isaac. Or but I'm going to lose my mind. Okay. There Go was ahead, you, can, you can look it up. The daughter no, no, that's lame. It's lame to take time on a podcast to look stuff up. <laughs> but the daughter, um, there there was one of them who the servant went to go get the daughter for the bride. Remember he had the camel, yeah. and then the girl brought the camel. Was that Isaac? And then Jacob's the it's one Jacob. that left. It's Jacob served seven years for Rachel. Yes. Okay. I'm right. All right. So Isaac is the one who they, the servant went and got the water for. Right. And mm -hmm. then Isaac gets old after that. And with that girl, the, the servant lady who he has the kids with, they have Jacob and Esau. And then Jacob and Esau, <laughs> we know their whole story Just... where Jacob tricks Esau to get the birthright. and Honestly, all kind of rude, lot. but it's fine. Yes. So <laughs> I remember so Jacob, that as I was kind of like doing the research for this, and I was like, you know, that wasn't cool. Jacob was a bit of a, a jerk. A bit of a slime ball <laughs> when you think about it. He was here, because here's he, my he like favorite son. Don't right. do anything to him. Yeah, and then he lied to his father. You remember he put the hair on his arms? Yeah. <laughs> Which is a really funny story. All right, so we have to we have to tell people real quick. So Isaac has two kids, Jacob and Esau, right? Mm -hmm. And Esau um, has the birthright as as they're they're twins. Jacob and Esau are twins. Yep. But Esau has the birthright because he grabbed Jacob's leg in yep. the womb. Remember? Did that mention <laughs> as they <laughs> as they're being born? It says the baby Esau like grabs Jacob's leg so that Esau comes out first. So Esau has the birthright. And it says that Esau was a hunter, and he would, like, hunt animals. He would hunt for skirts, and he was a very burly, hairy man. It yeah. says, it mentions this a lot, that he's covered in hair all <laughs> over his body. So, Jacob, being conniving one day, while they're out in the woods, uh, Esau's, like, starving to death. <laughs> like, he's just so hungry, because <laughs> uh, he hasn't caught anything. And Jacob comes out there with a bowl of soup. <laughs> And he says, like, oh, oh, thank God you brought me food. And Jacob goes, you, you can only have it if you give me your birthright. <laughs> and Esau, who's starving, is like, sure, whatever. So he takes, he gives Jacob his birthright and then eats the soup. So Jacob goes home to, I, so Jacob's father's Isaac. Isaac goes is home blind to, at this point. Isaac is blind at this point. He goes home to Isaac, who's a very old man, and Isaac's wife. Isaac's wife has always liked Jacob better. Jacob was always her favorite son. So she says, here's what we're going to do. So they take animal skins 
and they strap them to his arms because Isaac's blind, right? Mm -hmm. So they strap animal skins <laughs> up and down Jacob's arm. So whenever he goes into the tent with his blind father, his father's like, let me feel you. So he sticks his arm out and he, he feels the arms and he's like, oh yes, Esau, my son, and gives him like all the treasures and like stuff of his family before he dies. So Jacob, having done this, leaves. And then as he's leaving, and this is the, this is the relevant part, mm -hmm. I believe the reason he leaves is because he wants to go find a wife out in a distant land, which is where he works. He ends up working 14 years which becomes for this like girl. hyper illegal later. Yes, correct. <laughs> <laughs> which is like not the thing you're supposed to do. So he works 14 years to marry this girl. And then he does. And he's like, I want to go. He pulls a lot. And he's like, I want to go to the well-watered plains. I want to go out that direction. So I think it's him leaving that leads to the eventual captivity because it's while he's leaving and he sees the vision of Jacob's ladder and all that stuff uh, that he fights God. Like literally God's like, this is a bad idea. You don't want to go here. So he fights God all night and it says God touches his hip. And for the rest of his life, Jacob, who at this point was renamed to Israel, mm -hmm. if you'll remember, which means to Israel, with God, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, Israel's uh, he's named that because of the fight yeah. with God, uh, Jacob touch or God touches his hip and he immediately gets a walking condition and has it for the rest of his life. So he's renamed to Israel, which means to struggle to God. And him and his wife go out to a distant land, which is, I remember correctly, leads to the eventual captivity. I whenever, so. uh, 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 coat of many colors, Joseph, yeah. whenever, <laughs> whenever Joseph, I had to say coat of many coat colors, of many col <laughs> <laughs> whenever Joseph had to, uh, out of the land. So yeah, that's where that all connects. What was your original question? <laughs> I am struggling to recall. I'm sure I'll get there, but I do have to recognize something that was just sent in chat, which was Jacob got the first devious lick. Do you remember oh, that trend from TikTok yes. from like a year and a half? Ago? Like, oh my yeah. god. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say to the people who are super chatting, thank you. We will get to we will get to those. I have them like I'll, I'll pull them all up at the end, but that's usually like the last part of the show because we want to make sure we get through the program. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, um, I'm sorry. I didn't no, to you're go fine. To... You're fine. I, I thought to... about the hairy arms. It was like the people need to know. <laughs> it's very important that the people know about the hairy arms. Um, but I have I have everything up in front of me. Uh, but yeah, so I, we were talking about like why why did they leave and and yes, was there yeah, enslavement yeah. in Egypt part of it? Like, but God knows. God tells Abraham, He's like, Correct. you're you're yeah. gonna be sojourners in a foreign land, and Abraham's like, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, literally because uh abraham is in the promised land yeah and god's like it'll take you a long way to find your way back there and uh, your people and abraham's like i'm here right now and god's like it's gonna get complicated <laughs> don't worry god's like i know everything but i have decided i will not be telling you uh <laughs> i love it i love it it's just it feels very like as i look at it i just see so much of my own like experience with my father figures of them being like, I know how this is going to go for you, and I'm going to let you learn that lesson yourself. You're going you're gonna to make your own mistakes. <laughs> exactly. And I'm going to be here whenever you come back. Yeah. And I will yeah. be doing the same thing to my children. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so this, this all of this kind of leads to Moses being like, okay, fine, 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 I'll go. But I love that he's like, uh, God, my guy, I understand the assignment, but I'm really not good at talking. And so God does this weird thing he's like yeah but your brother aaron's pretty good at talking how about you you be me and aaron be you and moses is like sure yes yes that makes sense and this, <laughs> this, this this just continues for the rest of their lives where it's like moses moses is the guy actually talking to god and then he's playing whisper down the lane with aaron um which i just think is funny uh so there, there's two ways to look at that uh, I've heard different pastors give it different ways. For one, it's the idea that God will always be able to use you, you know, in spite of your flaws, mm -hmm. and God will bring people to help you to lift you up. I think I did a Sunday study about Aaron and her lifting up Moses' arms and how Aaron symbolically did that for his whole life. But um, Aaron was the one who was the leader of the people mm -hmm. to most of them. Yep. It's brushed over a lot, but a lot of the Israelites mentioned like, oh, Aaron's our leader, but he does what Moses says. Um, so there is a chance that Moses would have had the glory in life of being like the leader, the one to look up to, 
but he wasn't willing to do it. So therefore, Aaron had to be the one to step in. Because, And I've heard pastors, you know, uh, wisely take it the direction of if you don't want to be in God's will, God will get someone else to do it. You just pass up on blessings. Mm-hmm. Um, so it kind of depends on how you look at a lot of the stories of Moses in Numbers. But I feel like God that that was God saying his will would be done. Moses's part in it is up to him, essentially. Yep. And, and I think it also, there's an important little thing here, I think, in God selecting Moses against Moses's will. And then also selecting Aaron for a role that is subservient to Moses, despite the fact that Aaron's already in charge, and they both accept it. Yeah, and it's it's yeah. a, a message that, like, when you're given responsibility, you you take what you're given. You don't seek to be the leader. You Like, leaders yes. are—the best leaders are those who are given control, not those who take it. Um, and I think that that lesson is also in there and very important. Um, yeah. But as, as Moses is returning, and as he's, you know, being okay with suddenly being in charge— I uh, there's the, the episode where it says the angel of the Lord appears and is going to kill him. And I, this gets inserted in the most random possible place. It's like a two verse mention of, and God decided that he was going to kill Moses, but Zipporah <laughs> circumcised uh, Garam. So th- he didn't do it. Um, and then it just moves swiftly along to the next thing. It's just like the la- this one little itty bitty bit of the story. Um, but one one thing that I wanted to get your your insight on here because um, I think you'll understand the side of it better. The angel of the Lord, in terms of terminology, there have mm-hmm. been times when I've seen that and it's referencing Gabriel uh, as the messenger. But in this case, it it seems to be implying, at least in the King James version of the Bible, that we're dealing with. Uh, God himself coming. So what's, what is, can you explain the angel of the Lord terminology? So I think part of the reason it's hard for a lot of people to grasp is because two reasons. One, uh, we act like we have an exact knowledge of what angels are and how they operate, which isn't true. And we also act like a lot of the Old Testament stories operate the way New Testament or modern, you know, supernatural stuff operates, which also isn't true. Um, I feel in the Old Testament, whenever it mentions angel or angel of the Lord or what have you, unless they are specifically named, that can just be a vehicle for God. Mm -hmm. Like in the verses I just read about the burning bush, it said an angel was in the burning bush and then God spoke from the burning bush, right? So it's like, what is that? Perhaps the burning bush was just like the body or the visage of an angel. Mm -hmm. And then God spoke through the angel. It talks about a lot in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah especially, who said that um, the angels were God's mouthpiece. They were God's speakers throughout earth. So perhaps that is quite literal. God speaks through angels as a physical embodiment. Again, Old Testament, New Testament, Holy Spirit, all that's different. But during this time, whenever it mentions an angel of the Lord, that could just be the presence of God. It could be a physical embodiment that God then speaks through. Mm-hmm. So whenever it gets to this point, it says an angel of the Lord appears and then God speaks. I think that lines up with a lot of the other Old Testament stuff is this is just a, essentially a piece of God yeah. appearing before them. The one the, the explanation that I've seen a lot of times is that it's the pre-incarnate Christ and that that's Christ's role <laughs> pre <laughs> So you, uh, you seem to have an interesting reaction to that. So what do you? I think? yeah, I deal with like debate around that all the time. For one, I think that Jesus was never created in the same sense God was never created, because um, Jesus Himself said He was eternal, and I and the Father are one. Mm-hmm. Um, you can argue like whenever God made a piece of Himself, but Jesus, as He's known now, always exists mm-hmm. in my opinion, or at least you know the holy side of Him, whatever, not the body. Um, that being said, I feel that a lot of places in the Old Testament where people try to insert Christ Mm -hmm. are just people trying to find an easy explanation. One of the ones I hear it mentioned a lot is in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's story. Mm -hmm. Whatever uh, the soldier looks into the furnace. Yeah. And he said, behold, I see one who is as the son of God. Mm-hmm. Right. So people are like, oh, yeah, that's Jesus. <laughs> that's, that, that random Phoenician sol- or Babylonian soldier knew what Jesus looked like. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Like, no, he didn't. <laughs> I, I think a lot of 
verbiage like that, like son of God, angel of the Lord, mm -hmm. whatever, are all just different ways of saying pieces of God or God's messengers on earth. Um, Typically, the times when the term son of God is used, it also is referring to angels in the Old Testament. Correct. Yeah. Yes. There are, there's places where it specifically says the sons of God uh, mingled with the daughters of men, which yep. we know where that We've one goes. That one. <laughs> but, but that's definitely not saying Jesus, no. duh. So why would a place later in the Bible be referring to it as Jesus in the Old Testament? Um, at the end of the day, I look to specifically what Jesus said, and all Jesus said on the matter was, um, I and the Father are one, I am eternal, angels operate on earth, and that is what I stick with. So I think anytime it says, angel of the Lord, sons of God, that's like an angel or son of God, um, I don't necessarily think that means Jesus. At right. the same time, Jesus, I believe, can operate and have the same power as God since he's the same as him. So who's to say that Whenever God speaks through an angel, it's not also Jesus, but it doesn't really matter because the Trinity is one and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I don't I don't necessarily believe in all that pre-incarnate Old Testament Christ stuff. The more I understand the doctrine of the Trinity, the less I understand the doctrine of the Trinity, I'm finding. Like, I feel like every time I answer one question, there's just another one there. I, I'm going to I'm going to be 100 percent honest with you. But I, I was gonna be, I was gonna say like I don't care, but that sounds mean. <laughs> I don't mean I don't care to you. I'm saying you don't that care like about the the essence yeah, of the Trinity. You just understand yeah, it's there. Correct, because to me it's like okay, I don't understand how God spoke it and the word existed, right? Like I'm not that big, so why do I need to understand the concept of two people being one, right? Right. Um, I, if you ask me, God is a figure that is bigger than we can imagine, more powerful, more holy. Um, it makes sense that he has a physical embodiment who is considered to us as the son who comes to earth to enact for him in the New Testament whenever a sacrifice needs to be made as part of himself. And it makes sense because of that, that a part of his spirit dwells within us, which is the Holy Spirit. So, like, it's not a huge jump for me to say that God can have a physical form and a spiritual form that operate outside of his being, whatever his being even is. Um, so I, I'm okay with just being like, yeah, the Trinity is too big for me. Just yeah. like the concept of speaking the universe into existence. And I think that people need to be more okay with that. Like the idea that this, there are things that we're not going to understand and we can try and there's no harm in trying, but yeah. being able to admit that you don't understand something is a level of courage that I think a lot of people do not possess in modern society. Like it's okay to say you don't know. <laughs> what, what, what is that Christ said to the Pharisees? He who tries to understand the kingdom of heaven will never reach it. Something along uh, those lines, yeah. Yeah, like Christ says a lot of really cool stuff to the Pharisees. Yeah, it's, like, almost you know like, it's almost like he was perfect and knew exactly what to yeah. say at all times. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to remember the exact episode, but the one episode where they're like questioning him about the law and he's just destroying them all. Like, it's he's, like what? He's, yeah, like, I'm quoting Isaiah from memory, and the Pharisees are like, huh? <laughs> they did that all the time he would preach to children about honoring their parents and then they'd be like yeah well how do you feel about marriage or like tithing or whatever and he'd just be like what what's, what's your problem <laughs> if I, I think if i remember correctly it's the render unto caesar what is caesar's moment where he's like yes, is the gold yeah. roman give the gold to the rum like but why what does this have to do with god <laughs> but, yeah why do you care so much what's your issue with it exactly. yeah um, like you are so far he's like he's like what are religious leaders arguing with me about tax money that's way off the mark yeah we, yeah we came so close to jesus saying the magic three words taxation is theft <laughs> <laughs> i already so, knew what you meant by magic wish, three if only if only i could quote jesus when i say that uh, um all right, before you get struck by lightning keep yeah, going yeah no. <laughs> <With your mouth. laughs> But yeah, I wanted to actually mention at this point um, that uh, there is debate, some debate, on the actuality, the historicity of Moses. And uh, a lot of that in today's scholarship comes from scholarship by a uh, 20th century historian named Martin Noth. Now, Martin Noth argued that Moses was highly fictionalized, that the 12 tribes of Israel are another tradition that got mixed in during the 7th century, and that Judaism didn't really even exist until the 7th century. Um, Martin Noth fought for Germany during World War II, so there's that. <laughs> I was 
was while you were saying that i was thinking like what's this guy's problem with judaism and then, yeah um enough, i did yeah, some okay. research on him he wasn't oh he wasn't a member of the nazi party but he also was the kind of person who absolutely could have spoken out if he was against it and he seems to have chosen not to yeah and he and he fought for them when he was in a class it, like at that level when you're a, a scholar you're a professor you don't need like everybody's like oh well it was uh, mandatory that people fought for the journey. not for that class of people he could easily have <laughs> said no he chose to fight so uh you know i'm just i'm not going to say that he's completely unreliable but when somebody doesn't like jews and fights for the nazis you can you can ask questions He's there on the first day of the battle, like in the Vermont helmet, like, hey, I'm just I'm just doing my job. Yeah. <laughs> um one one bit of this that uh as we're as Moses is going into Israel, I think one of the things that is really cool, this is the first time that we get uh the the name Yahweh or the name Eye. Uh and it's because Moses says, Well, what when I go to the to the people to to Israel in Egypt, what do I tell them? Who did I speak to? And he, he just says, I am. And I think that that's like so cool. <laughs> I you you watched my Bible theory video, yeah. right? Great video. So, Fantastic thank you very video. Much. I appreciate it. The whole idea that uh, God, that I am, is just like an English translation of Yahweh or Yahweh or whatever. Like the uh, what do they call it? The tetra uh, tetragrammaton. Tetra, yeah, tetragrammaton tetragrammaton i think yeah it's tetragrammaton i'm pretty sure yeah. yeah so like that anytime i am is mentioned by god that's just a inset for the tetragrammaton mm -hmm. so the idea that when jesus was being arrested that he said it and it caused the great earthquake mm -hmm. it caused all of them to fall over ah oh, i love it <laughs> it's so great <laughs> yeah it's uh i i just I, there's those little nuggets where you get to stuff and you're like that's that's a good line like they're like that's so cool like i could you can just <laughs> picture it you know you sit there and you're like you picture moses speaking to god and speaking to the burning bush and he says well who are you and the bush just goes like in this booming voice like i am like that's just yeah. a really cool image yeah. to have um i wish that christian films weren't so god awful because it would be we great. just mentioned prince of egypt okay well, no that i i mean that like, i mean like the live action ones that come out like okay. on like right. straight to dvd ones there are a few really good bible story movies but for the most part i feel like you get a Commandments. Lot hold on you can't talk about this story in particular that has the ten commandments prince of egypt and there's another good one the, the, the other like the classics right ten commandments is one of the most classic movies ever but have you seen god's not dead ah uh, well. see you you take my point now <laughs> continue, continue. <laughs> there was a really good bible series on i think history channel like five ten years ago um that uh, the one about peter no it was just the bible it was just called the bible that's right okay yeah, yeah the bible was good and then they made a sequel series mm -hmm. to it i didn't see the sequel focused it was really good. It was focused on the disciples after Christ died. It was like the New Testament or like the book of Acts. Um, it was really good. And I remember I loved the guy who played Paul mm -hmm. to, to the degree that when I think of Paul, he's like my visual representation yeah. now. Um, but yes, yeah, you're right. Those are good. They make up for the God's not dead anyway. Yeah, continue. It's, um, but yeah, so I... Uh, there's so we get now we moses goes back and he goes to aaron and he's hold like on, hold on hold on hold on hold on i'm sorry someone in chat said we forgot veggie tales oh we did forget veggie tales we forgot veggie tales veggie, veggie tales, tales is iconic phenomenal some of the best anyway. cinema ever um, absolutely but yeah so uh he's told that he's going to lead the jews out of egypt he goes and he explains all this to aaron aaron's like got it cool i'm down um and this comes to a point where i uh, theology gets very complicated because we know <laughs> that humans have free will but we also have god telling moses he will harden pharaoh's heart and so you i i've been asking the question i've been struggling with this and i I'm, i want to know your perspective on it i uh, in my opinion when you look at it um aquinas for example says that god hardened moses god hardened pharaoh's heart so that uh he could display his power Basically, that if he just let Moses do it, then Pharaoh might actually listen to him and 
he wouldn't get to actually explain what's going on. Uh, uh -huh. Maimonides argued that it was a punishment for Pharaoh's sins that his heart was hardened and all of this happened to him. Um, I kind of, I, I found myself in a weird spot where, it, where I was looking like uh, Pharaoh is being granted the confidence to refuse Moses of his own free will in a way like that. Cause some of the translations are that he strengthens Pharaoh's heart not like mm -hmm. hardens it as in you know makes him cruel but he's strengthening pharaoh's fortitude and that's kind of how i've interpreted it w where do you fall on it i guess i just want to mention one of my favorite things about this podcast for those that don't know i like he tells me before the show like what we're getting into uh but he does like all the research all of these notes that is aiden aiden <laughs> is the man leading at home on this uh but what i love is that he has all this perfectly mapped out stuff like great history or whatever and whenever he hits like a daunting religious question he's like yeah so it's uh, it's wintergoon's turn i i, I, just, <laughs> I defer to you i feel like you're the better no, theologian. No, no. <laughs> no 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 i i enjoy it i do love it i just i just want to appreciate the setup for everyone because i feel like <laughs> some people watch this and think that part of it's scripted none of this is scripted <laughs> other than the notes that aiden has taken also, beforehand I can, I can barely read these like my handwriting is terrible <laughs> <laughs> this is chicken scratch <laughs> so aiden, aiden like gets all the historic stuff and he's like go ahead bible man <laughs> do your thing do you want the history and i do it <laughs> and i do it i i love doing it i do enjoy it um but <clears throat> i say that mostly just to rag on you a bit but uh i do i do agree with your assertion about the word hardening so the word hardened is mentioned other times in the new testament I'm sorry, the Old Testament, uh, whenever it's not just a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think it is in the book of Judges where it talks about, um, I want to say it's Esau, not Esau, uh, Ehud, the one with the knife, the dagger. Um, if I remember right, it says that he was scared and God hardened his strength, mm -hmm. something like that, right? There's another part where, it talks about, I think, Joshua directly, where it says uh, he hardened the hearts of the men around him, right? Yeah. And it doesn't even mean strengthened or given power to whenever I read it. it more, see, everyone... All right, so I think the reason that this is a problem historically is a lot of people will read Exodus, and they'll be like, huh, I have questions on this, and they don't keep reading. Mm -hmm. They don't read into the rest of the Old Testament wherever these concepts come up again. So it is, in my opinion... Um, that and again, this isn't any final say in religion. The word hardening is the best job an English translation can do at the idea of fortifying or of committing oneself to something. Because whenever it mentions it in Joshua, it's talking about his soldiers hardening their hearts towards Joshua, mm -hmm. right? They become more valiant towards him. So think about the situation Pharaoh's in. Pharaoh's court is filled with soothsayers and magicians mm -hmm. who can perform miracles, essentially, but they're not doing it through the power of God. They're doing it through wicked spirits. Mm -hmm. And what you also have to realize going on outside of everything that the book of Exodus is mentioning is that there is a spiritual war taking place. We see glimpses of it whenever it talks about uh, a messenger was stopped by the Prince of Persia, referring mm -hmm. to one of the, uh, the or that's in the I book of Daniel, I think. that one is about Michael. Like the, yes, the theology yeah. suggests it's Michael. Or, Michael comes and stops the prince, right? It says yeah, that Michael yeah. shows up. Yeah, to uh, the, the prince of Persia, which is a demon, because princes are mentioned, or principalities, mm -hmm. as being these, um, uh, uh, both, it's a class of angels and demons throughout the Bible. So a wicked prince of Persia is stopping a messenger, and then the archangel Michael comes and stops the prince of Persia, as it's called. So you have, like, these constant mentions of warring, religious bodies in the background you have god you have which in my opinion the lesser gods that are mentioned are uh demons That's or different classifications of demon yeah so you've got like you know um Baal, dagon you have all these entities yes hamash you have all these entities that are being worshipped that do have power they do have prophets of their religion who can do things but all of that is a minuscule of the power of god mm -hmm. so we have pharaoh a great leader who has surrounded himself with potentially hundreds of different 
false gods, uh, prophets, and magicians, and soothsayers. And who can do way, just to quickly interject on on Egyptian like theology, they believed that the Pharaoh was a god incarnate. Yes, correct. Yeah. So whenever the Pharaoh um, has the, he, the, like he believes himself to be a god, he he has all these different gods. Uh, prophets around him who can perform magic to some degree or black magic as we mm-hmm. call it um whenever the bible says god hardened his heart from what i see later in the bible i don't think that means god made him deaf to the words of moses it means that his free will the decision that god gave him because remember free will is a gift um the free will that god gave him is going to draw into himself his heart is going to, he is going to become more of what he already is. He's not going to be willing to hear you out. He's just going to fall back on what he knows. He's going to become more driven unto himself. So when God hardened his heart, Pharaoh's own free will is going to continue what Pharaoh's doing, not what you want him to. Yes. That's always been my take on it. That was exactly why I pitched it to you to answer. It, this is why it, <laughs> see, you're like, hey, no, it springs things on me. And then you go off on something like that. And I'm like, okay, see, that's better than anything I could possibly have said. <laughs> no, I love, I love doing it. It's just funny to <laughs> rag on it for the views, but yes, yeah, I, um, I enjoy it. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, and I think as we get into this part where they are going to Pharaoh and they're speaking to him a lot, that I, something that like it, I had forgotten about, was that they're not originally asking Pharaoh, hey, can we leave permanently? They're like, can we leave for three days to go worship our God? And Pharaoh is just like, mm, no. <laughs> no, you cannot do that. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah, it was temporary at first, yeah. And I I do I do have a feeling that the reason they asked for three days may have been to get ahead of the Egyptian army. That's just what I was and about to say. Like, I'm pretty sure that's what was going on there, but that's not even what they approached him with. They weren't like, hey, can we just permanently go back to Canaan? They were like, hey, uh, can we go worship God in the forest for three days? And Pharaoh's like, nah, I need you to work. Go, go, go ahead. Let us out. You can trust us. <laughs> we, we won't do anything. I don't blame them. Like, <laughs> sometimes you got to pull a sneaky on them. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would have done the same. So Pharaoh refuses to let them go, and then he orders any such requests to be met with more work. Um, and the, the more work is, Hey, you guys need to bake more bricks, but we're going to take away the stuff that lets you bake them. Um, like they were supposed to be sun baked bricks wrapped in straw. And he said, you guys can't have any more straw. And they're like, how can we bake the bricks? Then he was like, I don't know, figure it out, man. Um, and so for this, Moses goes and he talks to God and God's like, no, no, I got this. I got this. So here's what you're going to do. Um, and then we get the, the first of the plagues, uh, and I did want to bring up, because it's in my notes, I'd forgotten about this. Uh, it's also noted in Exodus that this is the first time God has represented himself as Yahweh, as as mm. a yet. This is Interesting. Previously, he when he introduces himself to Abraham, when he speaks to Isaac and Jacob, he calls himself El Shaddai. He calls himself God Almighty. So, mm. like, this is, this is a moment where he's getting a little bit more uh, intimate with Moses and saying, you know, here's my name, not just my title, not Elyon, not El, which just means God. Uh, it's I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. And then he says, I am. I'm Yahweh. Like, this is my name. Uh, so that's And that's why that term has so much power and why it's used so sparingly in, in Judaism is that it's... It's a very powerful term, you know? Um, also, lovechat1.xyz, best adult dating site, is spamming the chat, so uh, I think they may have found the wrong audience. Uh, whoever purchased that bot. I think this is a very uh, funny place to do that. Yeah, like, uh. my guy. Uh, <laughs> Read guy, the room. Some guy in a, like, you know, bot coding center somewhere in Africa is, like, you know, getting paid to do weird work. Um, oh yeah the bible podcast yeah, that's, that's our that's next it. target that's where we want to go for the <laughs> sex spot uh, <laughs> who needs that more than anybody christians uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah so i uh, we then get to this this point where there's the first plague uh after the serpent incident and that first plague is that the nile turns red he turns the Nile. In some cases, he's, it says he turns it to blood. In other cases, it said it's just turned red. I've seen suggestions that God uh, inspired an algal bloom to turn it red, um, which I, I'm one of those people who I'm like, all right, well, God created a natural world. He'll work within the yeah. natural world. 
Um, so I could see it being either one. I know that you fall more on the like, yeah, God turned it to blood side, but I could, yeah, I, could I go mean, either way. I, I'm not saying that to like diss your idea of like uh, it, it, like God works within the natural world because I think He does too to a large degree. I think some of the miracles of the Old Testament may be a little um, frivolous with that because yeah. you know God worked much more directly than He does now. However, um, th- what's funny is people who try to justify things to the natural world. Like again, I don't care about you feeling that if yeah. if it changed with the. Uh, things the stuff in the water but i know people who do that because they see it as evidence of god and that's Mm. what always rubs me the wrong way whenever someone's like see god's real because there's a bacteria that makes water red it's like hey bud i don't know if you knew this um but i think the guy who made the universe Yeah. Can make the water into blood if he ever so if he desires. Decides to, he probably I think do that. I think he can. I think that's within his realm of power. Again, people do that all the time. They're always like, "There's this. Uh, th- th- we found a palm tree on the top of a mountain. That means that the flood happened. It's like, sure, maybe, but like." Is There's that your hangup? <laughs> yeah. yeah, if we find out it's a pine tree, are you like, oh, I guess God isn't real? Like, what is your issue? <laughs> That's the problem is when you lean too heavily on that stuff, you get to a point yeah. where like, you're going to make it really easy to disprove you if you go yeah. too hard on that side That's what. That's what happens all the time. That's what kills me about you. You mentioned God's not dead. That's what kills me mm-hmm. about a lot of like the neo Christian things where it's like, oh, well, if you look at the charts, you can actually prove God. <laughs> Jesus was a real person. It's like, that's your hang up that, that like, oh, we found this letter. Now God's real. It's like, yeah, sure. That helps if you're already in the face, but don't make people's understanding of God be like 12th century letters. Exactly. That That's no one can prove if they're real. Yeah, yeah. Like, Oh, well the whole Bible was biased, but there was this one homeless guy living in Athens who saw Paul <laughs> once that, that does it. He's real. <laughs> also, how'd you find out about Diogenes? Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, like, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this, um, all this the stuff that gets uh, discussed here, by the way, there's there's some more historical stuff I wanted to involve, um, because while all this is going on, timeline-wise, if I'm right about the timing that this is all happening in 1208, 1207, 1206, uh, this is during a period when Merneptah is fighting the Sea Peoples, and there's a few different things that happen here that might, people say that there's no Egyptian references to the Exodus, uh, except... Or, or even the Jews being there. That's the one that really gets me is uh, there's no evidence of the Jews being there. Um, there was, after he defeats the Nine Bows in this one consequential battle, he takes the uh, um, members of all of the dead who are, circumcised, who are uncircumcised and the right hand of all the dead who are circumcised. There are only two cultures in the region that circumcise at this time. It's the Egyptians and the Jews. So unless there was an Egyptian rebellion involved, it seems like there were Jews actively rebelling against Merneptah at this time, or at least a group of Jews. So that's a little interesting piece that I found in there. Um, and then, of course, there's the part where the Merneptah Stella refers to Israel. So the whole thing about Israel not ever being referenced by the Egyptians is kind of weird. Um, I... I I find these arguments very strange because they rely on people not using Google. But the Merneptah Stella, for those who weren't here at the beginning of the show, uh, has a line where it discusses the destruction of several groups. And then among them, and it refers to them as nations and lands. And then it gets to Israel. And it refers to Israel as being a person. It refers to Israel with male pronouns. Which means that they are referring to the the children of Israel, of Jacob. They are talking specifically about the tribe of the Jews who do not, at this time, have a country. They don't have a land, which means that they're semi-nomadic or nomadic. And therefore, you can kind of make... It, it, it kind of is proving the point about the Jews being at least known to Egypt at the time, if not in it. So again, like I said, like you just said, that's not, you know, perfect evidence of anything, but it it drives me insane when people are like, there's no evidence of this whatsoever when there clearly is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I didn't mean that to say like the evidence doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm specifically referring to people who stake the existence on God on like newfound partial evidence. Like as a Christian who who I'm already, you know, I'm already sold on it. 
like I find a lot of the stuff encouraging, like what you're talking about, finding historic records that back up the history of it and stuff. But at the same time, I've seen people who argue that to atheists as like, look, now you have to give your love to Christ. It's like, that's not how that part of it works, my, my guy. But between us, yes, I think it is incredibly yeah. fascinating. Obvi- I mean, I'm here. Obviously, I love the history and analysis of it. <laughs> it's a fun thing to study. Um, and, and you do get those breakthroughs where you're like, ah, yes, finally. Like, I got it. Um, yeah. But yeah, so the, the river turning to blood does not seem to sway Pharaoh. Uh, so they go back and they say, well, well, what do we do now, God? And uh, Isaiah, what does God say? Do you remember? Do you remember the order here? Because this is just ridiculous. It's uh, it's the frogs. It's the next, frogs right? thing. Yeah, bring in the frogs. <laughs> bring like, in the I toes. Got this. <laughs> and just <laughs> that millions probably of frogs yeah. just emerge from the Nile, and they go everywhere. And it mentions that they go into the homes, and they go into the businesses, and the palaces, and the temples. They're in the fields. They are everywhere. And Pharaoh, Pharaoh starts doing this thing where he's like, yeah, yeah, just get rid of the frogs and I'll let you go on your little trip. Um, and then they get rid of the frogs. And the problem is the frogs don't evaporate. Uh, the frogs just die. And the Bible mentions how bad it smells. <laughs> Which is a whole nother problem. Now there's dead frogs exactly. everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, you know, it's it's just... <laughs> Like, did nobody think this one through? Uh, I like how God keeps creating problems that even once they're solved, they're still kind of annoying. Um, like, yeah. the, God is a mad, he's a mastermind, like, of, of how to punish people. Uh, but the next thing that happens is uh, God tells Moses to tell Aaron to to whip up the dust and turn it to lice. And this is the first one that, like, Pharaoh's magicians go, wait, What? <laughs> Like, we can't do that. Because the Pharaoh's magicians are like, yeah, we can bring frogs, too. But they can't yeah, do the lice the thing. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Pharaoh does the same thing again. And he's like, uh, you know, all right, fine, fine, fine. And then God hardens his heart again. And and he, he doesn't get through it. And Moses calls up swarms of flies uh, that specifically avoid Jewish people. I also, I also want to mention... Very funny. I also want to mention um, in those verses, every time it talks about it, because in the beginning it says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? And again, I believe that's because of my mentioning of free will. Mm -hmm. I double down on that because whenever it mentions the Pharaoh rejects one of the plagues, it says, but when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Mm -hmm. So that's pointing out that God didn't particularly make pharaoh do it it's just like you said earlier god can see all so god's saying hey he's not going to listen for a while because god knows where this is going so as the lord said pharaoh hardened his heart it's just the language difference but yes i'm doubling down on my belief that it was a pharaoh's own accord continue somebody brought up in chat the uh the belief that the plagues may be used to insult the egyptian gods because uh the nile turning to blood is insulting um Hoppy, uh, the frogs are insulting, um, her name is escaping me, another god, and then, uh, basically the, the lice, the lice one doesn't seem to connect, and that's why I don't totally buy this one, I'm like, alright, well, what are the lice for? But they basically, uh, people have connected each one of the plagues to a god, um, yes. a, an Egyptian god, I don't know how I feel about it, mainly because the lice thing, I just can't find one for the lice, and uh, the fourth plague, also the the flies. I it the version I've seen is that that god uh, yes. specifically, like Wajed, I think, um, appears as a fly. But I couldn't find an example of that. But maybe I just didn't look hard enough. Oh, what are your uh, thoughts? Yes, the god, the god of itchiness. Yes, the god of itchy. <laughs> um, I wouldn't be surprised if God were to do something like that. There's several stories in the Bible where similar things happen. Uh, the one that comes to mind is that uh, the whenever they put the Ark of the Covenant next to Dagon, mm-hmm. remember that? Vaguely. They were like, oh, the, 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 they captured the Ark of the Covenant. This is while, pretty sure while Joshua was, was alive. Um, the I think it was the Canaanites. They captured the Ark. And they were like, oh, yeah, we finally got the children of Israel's big treasure. We'll bring it and give it as a sacrifice to Dagon. So they bring it into the temple of Dagon and set it down. 
and then they leave and the next night they come the next day they come inside and the statue of dagon had fallen over and the arms were broken off of it so they put the statue back up re uh, put the arms back on it the next day statue falls over arms break out and that happens for like three days until they're like we got to get rid of this ark so they essentially give it back they're like we don't want it anymore but yeah um it's a constant thing in the old testament that whenever someone who doesn't know better there's a big difference too by the way between a child of god Mm -hmm. doing something like worshiping another god and the gentiles at the time doing it because whenever they punish for it they don't really get punished for it because they're not held to the same standard as the children of God. So whenever they have the false God, God's just kind of like, get these false idols out of here now, <laughs> just pushing them get over, knocking stuff me. down. <laughs> get them away from me. Yeah. Like... <laughs> so <laughs> Pharaoh was tormented I... by thousands of Pepe memes. Just keep talking. I can't. <laughs> that today Just well somebody it's heavy can't. burn man super I'm chat my for ten dollars uh and on the redacted day god gaveth us frog uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that's how okay. chat's dealing with this conversation <laughs> Why are they talking about milk i keep glancing down don't and seeing the word don't milk. even think about it. don't worry about it okay don't all worry right, about the milk right. i made a mistake i am just continue master. um <laughs> Keep going, going Aiden. It's the Wendigo milk. It's again the the more the more that you ask questions, the worse it's going to get. Uh, this podcast I is known. a year and a half old now. <laughs> like, I should have known. I should have known. Yeah. Um, but uh, whew, where are we now? Um, I think fault. I skipped some plagues somehow. We're uh, we're at the lice. Or the frogs yes, the and lice. the lice. After the lice, I. <laughs> Pharaoh, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what it, what is it he does. Um, he just refuses them again. I think after, after the lice, yeah, he uh, God's like, you know what, you don't get to have cows anymore. <laughs> That's the next plague. Is he just kills oh, all yeah? The cows. Here's here's the specific wording around the lice. Um, after Aaron does the whole flipsy thing and lice appear, it says, and the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice. But they could not. So there was lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. So, again, double, triple cover. It does that after every plague. Pharaoh's hardening his own heart, and also the magicians are like, this. Who, whatever God they follow must be the real deal if he can do all this. So, yeah. And over this time, the... The Egyptians are becoming more and more, like, in awe of Moses in general. The Egyptian public, the, the nobles, the priests, they're all like, what is this guy? And yeah. what is this power he has? So Also, if you follow what is my belief, and most religious people's belief, I'd say, that these false gods that the magicians worshipped were like the demons, or like the fallen angels, so to speak. Um, along that thought, you have the idea that, yeah, these people had some level of power, of the diminished God that these angels departed unto them. But that is absolutely nothing compared to the original source of those angels power yeah. being God, which exactly. is the reason they're so quickly bested. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the cattle, the cattle get killed. I do feel kind of bad for the cows. Uh, that's rough. Or cows. Um, but uh, or- next God, God does not come after the cattle next. Cause of course, why would Pharaoh, uh, you know, succumb here? Um, no, God sends a plague of boils. Mm, yep. uh, I've seen people uh, suggest that this was bubonic plague. I've seen smallpox. It doesn't really particularly matter. It would be very uncomfortable if your entire population suddenly developed boils. Um, that would that would cause a lot of problems. Uh, and then and then after uh, after this, and Pharaoh is still fighting it. Uh, Moses just straight up drops some bars for the Lord. Uh, <laughs> He says, uh, on behalf of Jehovah himself, <laughs> he says, on behalf of on behalf of Jehovah, he says, for I will this time send all my plagues upon thy heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth, which is a powerful statement of like, he's literally challenging the Pharaoh and being like, your gods are not me. You don't know what you're dealing with. Like I and I just I love when when there's lines like that where it's just straight to the point 
you don't know what you're dealing with. I am God. I uh, and the Old Testament is full of it. Bro, my favorite my favorite character in probably the whole Bible, but definitely my favorite in the Old Testament's Elijah mm-hmm. because he did that nonstop mm-hmm. all the time. He never quit. <laughs> he was constantly <laughs> sarcastic or over the moon about mm-hmm. something to the degree that whenever he was about to be taken up to heaven uh, and he was talking to um Elisha, his second in command. Mm-hmm. I like uh, that it's Elijah he said, and Elisha. Elisha, yeah. So I helpful. forget what the name. I forget what the names mean. Elijah's like God. God's power is, mm-hmm. um, and Elisha's like God's power is forever or also, something like for that. For people who don't know anything about Hebrew, whenever you see a name with the word L in it, the 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 not the but yeah, the word L, it usually means that that name has something to do with God. So just something to be aware of as you're reading, like L typically has to do with God, even in names. Elijah, Elisha, um, Daniel, Daniel, Eli. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of them. Speaking uh, of Daniel, I'm trying to find it because I there's a bit in there that I wanted to reference, but I'm struggling to find. There it is, Daniel. Um, but, where I'm lo- I'm losing my mind. Where is fine. Uh, Elijah mentioned just his excellent Vegas number store on Joshua Judges Road first. Say your moment. Here's Daniel. Daniel's angel and so would I. I'm saying all the books of the Bible in my head. I can't. It's okay. Hold on. Um yes. did you do that as a kid? Could you say yeah. all the books of the Bible? Once yeah, that was like time. that. That was the cool guy. Can you still do it? No. <laughs> How far do you think you can get? Not far. Let's do it. Let's do it's, it right now. It's go. Not... Go. Start. You know the first uh, one. Go. It's Genesis, Exodus. I always mix up Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Ooh, it's, it's Leviticus, Leviticus. Deuteronomy, Numbers, uh, Joshua. And that's about as far as I get. Okay. Right. You also skip Deuteronomy. That's okay. I, did I skip Deuteronomy? No, because I said Deuteronomy and Leviticus, and then I, like switched over yeah, yeah, okay i see i see i see all right fair enough fair enough all right i'm trying to find uh the, that, um... that was like the cool i can still do it but that was like the cool guy thing in like bible school yeah you could say all of them yeah yeah i, I remember that there's a line in daniel i think five somewhere that i wanted to mention but i i can't find it so i'll just i'll just point out like my favorite bit of of daniel is the headlines um because we get uh, Belteshazzar's feast, we get Belteshazzar's contribution uh, to the feast, uh. unrestrained sensuality, uh, God's contribution <laughs> to the feast, handwriting on the wall, and Daniel's contribution to the feast, the announcement of the doom. <laughs> I just... <laughs> Whoever, the people compiling the KJV must have had a bit of a sense of humor, because that's just objectively a funny way to break things up. Uh, but did you find what you were looking for? Uh, yeah, it's in Kings. I should have known it was in Kings. Um, it's after. Uh, 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 I don't. You can continue. We don't have to stay on this. There okay. was just a cool line I wanted to say. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep reading if you want to keep looking. I'll, I got my notes. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, you continue. But yeah, so uh, the 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 plague of boils is not enough to sway Pharaoh. Uh, and so Moses kind of is like, you know, all right, I uh, check this out. And he causes a massive thunderstorm with hail and thunder and lightning, the likes of which Egypt has never seen. And people and animals are killed by hail in the fields. It's like the, the worst thunderstorm imaginable. Um, and at this point, God actually has a moment with Moses where he kind of explains like the reason I'm doing this is so that future generations will understand my power when you tell them about it. Like, I'm showing you all of this now so that the future generations don't have to see it firsthand, so that you can explain, so you can tell them. And uh, and, and it seems like, you know, a pretty efficient message, um, except for the part where, like, 40 years after this, they start worshiping false idols in the desert. Which, you know, that's cool, I guess. I... Uh, after this, we get the locusts, uh, and finally Pharaoh begins to offer compromises, um, because the locusts are somehow the biggest problem he faces here. Uh, Pharaoh offers compromise by allowing the men to go into the woods and or, and worship, 
but not the women or the children, which, of course, what Moses is doing here is trying to get his people out of Egypt, so that's not going to work. They, ha- they can't leave stuff behind so they can come back for it. Uh, and that's not enough. Uh, Pharaoh says he's sorry, and, like, the, the locust plague ends, but he then pulls the same, th- the same thing. And then we get the plague of darkness. And this is the one where I had a pretty intense revelation today. Uh, the plague of darkness is the ninth of the plagues. It's the second to last one. And it is said that it is a darkness that you can feel, that it's oppressive. Um, and this is one of those things where, again, people keep pointing out, like, okay, but what, you know, there's none of that in in the Egyptian record. What are you talking about? And I keep pointing out, you know, that's because the Egyptians didn't like to mention when they lost. <laughs> but there is something in the Egyptian record here. And the astronomical record. On October 30th, 1207 BC, there was a full solar eclipse. October 30th, 1207 BC is effectively, give or take a year, uh, the fifth year of the reign of Merneptah. Remember that they were not using the same construction of days and months that we use. Now, we know that in the fifth year of Merneptah's reign, he had the Isra- the, the uh, Merneptah Stella cr- created, which mentions the destruction of the tribe of Israel, which would be how he would explain Israel completely disappearing from Egypt, is we destroyed them, they're gone, their seed is no more, I can't remember the exact terminology, but he basically says, you know, all right, well, this, you know, Israel is gone, but around exactly the same time that he says Israel is gone, there is a solar eclipse, which is about the exact same time that we get the plague of darkness, which means that it is entirely possible the exact date of the plague of darkness is October 30th, 1207 BC. And I think I might be the first one what? to come up with that. Oh. I never heard that before. I told I told him I figured this out before the show, but I didn't Whoa, tell him. Oh, that's reasoning. really cool. No, no, that's the same. So a lot of people will look at Old Testament stories for those that don't know and be like, well, this is a pretty big event. Why isn't it mentioned anywhere? Mm-hmm. And it's like I had said, a lot of the time they just didn't want to record it. But the fact that there was a, um, a uh, eclipse. eclipse recorded on October the 30th. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's pre- how long did the how long did it last? Three days? It says three days, but the thing is three also gets used a lot as a, a lot, symbolic yeah. number. Um, so... And it's also possible, all we know is that there was a solar eclipse. We don't know exactly how long it lasted. God is Interesting. God. Interesting. So yeah, God it's is God. Possible. Yeah, God yeah. Like, you know what? We're just going to have this be a three-day eclipse. Uh, it's a three-day eclipse. It's right here. <laughs> but the point is, think about how you would describe that. 1200 BC. How would you describe an eclipse? You would you would say there was a com- there was there was a darkness during the darkness. day. It was oppressive. You yeah. were scared. People people today are scared of eclipses when they don't know what's happening. Like if you weren't told there's a solar eclipse today and it got dark in the middle of the day, would your immediate reaction be, "Oh my god, there's an eclipse?" Probably not. If if you're wow. Donald Trump, your reaction to an eclipse is to stare directly at it. Um, <laughs> you know, man, man chose to stare down the sun. I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not gonna lie. Whenever that last solar eclipse happened, I stared right at it too. Yeah, we had we like had, I don't need these stupid glasses. Yeah, just yeah. It was my cool. professor brought in <laughs> special glasses that we could use to look at it. Um, yeah, which yeah. was cool. But yeah, it was. I mean, just imagine that. But think about that. 1207 BC, the October 30th, 1207 BC, there's a solar eclipse. It fits correctly within the general timeline of Exodus when it should be. It is like, how incredible would it be to find a way to prove that? Like, I would love to do that. I want to try. But with, with the information available right now and the fact that that, that tablet from Mount Ebal dates to sometime in the 12th century, so within 50 to 60 years after this, like, yeah, but uh, anyway, that would mean that the first Very cool. pass- that would mean Fantastic. that the first Passover happened. I'm proud of you. Very <laughs> <Thank> cool. <laughs> you. That would mean that the first Passover happened in 1206 BC. There you go. Wow, that's, that's very cool. Yeah, I'm I'm proud of myself for that one. That's fantastic. <laughs> I like that. I mean, it lines up with all the dates, right? Also, so, not that it's that important, but it's also cool that it's on All Hallows Eve. Yeah, that's. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Ooh. 
<laughs> spicy. I know, right? Yeah, that's really cool. Awesome, the, man. The Very spicy cool. Bible like podcast. Um, <laughs> the spicy. No, it's no. It's Do not David. give them it's that. Do not David. give them that. <laughs> That's David. Oh no! Here's all the times David screwed up. <laughs> that's that's very cool, my man. Yeah, I like that. You. I'm going to continue to uh, parrot that for now. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna look into that one more so I can, yeah. I can either prove or disprove no, myself. I don't, but I'm, I I'm don't need to. Here. You convinced me. I'm gonna blindly <laughs> okay. say it forever. <laughs> but anyway, God saying no son for you isn't enough. So He finally says, "All right, all your firstborn are are dead." Like how you feel about yeah. that? How you feel about that, Pharaoh? And I. Uh, this one I actually did try and corroborate, but unfortunately, uh, Egyptian records of children who did not become the pharaoh are not great. So I could not find a reference to whether or not Merneptah had a firstborn son who died um, suddenly. Uh, it probably wouldn't get mentioned. The only one I could find that was mentioned was actually Ramses' first son, Ramses II, who would have been Merneptah's older brother. Um, also, Merneptah was like 70 when he ascended to the throne which is insane. But Ramses lived yeah. so long. And it does lend a bit of credence to these stories of people living 90, 100, 120 years. Ramses lived over 90 years. Well, it says uh, in, the, in Genesis after the flood that man, God thought fit that man's day should be 120 years on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do see a lot of that with yeah. like Moses and pharaohs and things such as. So yeah. yeah, the 120 number is very common. Um, but yeah, so I, the, the plague of death is how we get to Passover because he assigns the, uh, month of Abib, which is part of March and the, uh, the beginning of April to be, um, the first month of the year for the Jews. And that Passover will be on the 14th day of that month. Um, and so that marks approximately five months between the darkness and the plague of death. But I... God's instructions for Passover are uh, very specific. There's, you're, you got to slaughter a lamb that has to be in its first year. You have to paint the, uh, paint your doorways with its blood. You have to eat as much of the lamb as possible while wearing specific clothing, like a loincloth, shoes, and carrying a rod. And then you have to make sure that everything that remains of the, uh, of the animal is gone by sunrise, which includes like basically burning what's left. Um, and that's how we get to, to Passover. Uh, and of course, like I said, if you, if you look at this and you say, how could God order such a, a horrible act? Well, you got to remember that the Pharaoh ordered the exact same thing of the Israelites 40 years earlier. So. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, blood for blood things like that throughout the old Testament. Uh, Pharaoh's decision was to kill um, um, hundreds, if not thousands, of children. And then from there, he was given 11 chances. So were the people around him. Mm -hmm. The people of Egypt decided to stick in Egypt and be by his side um, through 11 different sufferings, 11 different proofs that God is who he says he is. And, over uh, and they continuously said no. A span of time, like the fact that the, the darkness is... If if I'm correct, but if the darkness is that eclipse in 1207, and then we're looking at the uh, the the Passover being five months later, that means that this wasn't like the Bible kind of phrases it as if it was a back to back to back. Yeah. But we also get that with the six days in Genesis, which start before there's a sun. So, um, you know, what does day what mean? Does what day does mean? time day mean? Seems yeah, to be yeah. A, yeah. So, uh, are they doing? Is this day after day? No. It, it kind of says end the next day. It doesn't necessarily mean. It doesn't say tomorrow. It doesn't say the very next yeah, day. Yeah. So it could just be the next day that they went to Pharaoh, which could have been any period of time. So this could have been occurring over a period of months, if not years, um, that these people were witnessing these plagues and understanding what was going on and chose to stay. Uh, and of course, at the same time, there's also all this turmoil all over Egypt from the Sea Peoples and all of that. It's a rough time, but there's yeah. So, sometimes Rome needs to burn, yeah. And if you didn't get out, it still needs to burn. Yeah. That's that's <laughs> the other thing too is like people ask, you know, well, if there were famines and all of that, why weren't they getting recorded? It's because famines were so freaking common. <laughs> it just happened. <laughs> there yeah, were so many yeah. famines. It's like it's like the same thing with children dying. Kids dying was a pretty popular weekend activity yeah, back then. That, that, they didn't that's write it down. Like, no. The the reason that ancient and medieval and all the all those lifespans, the reason that the average is so short, is not that like the middle fifty percent of people were dying at thirty. It was that 
if you made it past infancy, you were probably going to make it to 60 or 70. But if yeah. you, but a, like, there was like a 50% mortality rate for I, childbirth. I heard, I don't know how accurate this is in the modern age since the population boom, but that in the old time, at least pre like 1940, um, there were m- more people in human existence who did not live to be one year old than there are people mm-hmm. uh, who lived past one year old. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. It's infant mortality was utterly insane numbers early on. Yeah. They just, they just, they just quit existing. It just, it just happened. <laughs> yeah. But this, this one seems to be the final straw for Pharaoh because he loses his son. And so finally he's mm. directly affected and he yes. just orders the Jews to leave. He tells them to get out, um, which is when the exodus begins Israel has spent 430 years in Egypt, which is how I get the number where Joseph got there around 1636, uh, or uh, Jacob got there around 1636, and Joseph was there already. Um, But yeah, that's so that tells us that uh, the pharaoh who did not know Joseph was probably Semken. He was probably of the 15th dynasty and probably a Hyksos, which means he actually would be Canaanite, which kind of might explain why... The Jews and the Canaanites just continue to not get along. They might have gotten there and been like, wait a second, you're the same people. Um, <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, the, the, just from the very start, the Jews have had a rough time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's where the Bronze Age collapse kind of follows this. Like, if you think that Egypt got off scot-free in this, even after the Jews left, they didn't they they collapsed completely and there is a very dark period of time before the new kingdom starts it's like it, jesus really felt or jesus egypt really felt the wrath of god um i'm not sure where jesus came from there <laughs> but yeah so that's uh that's where we are with exodus um interesting yeah do you have do you have more words on exodus though before uh before we jump into Super other chance, random yeah. topics and jumps, um, we can come back and do the actual. I, I feel like this is something where we can do the the wilderness period as well as a separate thing. Yeah, I think we could continue Exodus. There's definitely a lot there to work on. Um, you, I mean, you did a great job of covering the plagues <laughs> and whatnot. I I will say a lot of the uh, stuff that God did in the Old Testament, I, and I don't say this to mean that it didn't actually happen and God did symbolism, but God used a lot of real world events that would later translate to us. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is a beauty to the idea of the blood of the lamb. So for those that don't know, whenever the Passover actually happened or the original Passover, it said the death angel would go through Egypt and any house that did not have the blood of an innocent lamb above the doorpost and on the sides of the doorpost, um, that house would have their uh, eldest die. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted to avoid death, you had to take the blood of the innocent and put it across your doorway, right. which is a picture to us of Christ, an innocent lamb brought forward who through his blood, we are able to avoid death. Um, I've even heard ministers point out that the way it was instructed to do the top and the sides of the door makes a cross. Mm-hmm. Uh, so quite literally the physical symbolism and of the trinity. blood of the cross and the Trinity, uh, the blood of the cross and the Trinity being what protects us from death. So there is this constant symbolism throughout the entire old Testament of Christ always being there or the plan always was. Cause if you look in the garden of Eden, it talks about how one day the son of man will come to bruise the serpent's head. All the way back then, at the beginning of humanity, Christ was uh, prophesied. And throughout the entire Old Testament, we have recurring provisions of that. And one of the most apparent is the idea that the blood of the Lamb saves us from death. Um, So there's a lot of beauty like that that I see throughout the story of Exodus. Um, There's a lot of beauty I see with uh, the miracles that uh, Moses performs. There's a lot of beauty in Moses' journey. Um, And it's definitely... A lot of people make the mistake from a Christian perspective of viewing these stories as just like, well, this is a very interesting thing that happened, but there's still messages and um, applications that we can bring out of it. And I always love coming across some of those, like uh, like the Passover, like the Death Angel. Um, it, it's neat not only from a historical and study perspective, but from an application and spiritual perspective as well. So Agreed. Yeah, it's... It's really 
the whole story is so incredible in so many ways and the way that things interweave later on and you know the the fact that th there are things that happen and get referenced that the people who were around in moses's time could never have imagined and then the people who were around in daniel's time had the same experiences and over and over again there's just so much that's being revealed constantly throughout time it's truly yeah. just every every bit of it is like immaculate to to begin to understand and um you know it's it, it really is the greatest story ever told <laughs> it is isn't it yeah yeah, um, yeah i agree but i will at this point take us over to super chats the way we do this is that uh we will read super chat questions first we usually dedicate like a half hour um can you do a half hour yeah i can do a half hour i was gonna say before i do that uh can i read that verse from elijah sure. that i wanted to Go think it. All right, so the, whenever you were talking about cool zingers, this is my favorite zinger in the whole Bible, I think, maybe excluding some of the stuff Christ said. So to give the audience a bit of a background, mm -hmm. at this point, the king of Israel was someone known as King Ahab, who was incredibly wicked. He worshipped Baal, he slaughtered prophets at random, he sacrificed babies, not a good guy. Um, and he was the king over Israel, right? So at this time, all of Israel was essentially forced to worship this false god. So God brings a prophet forward by the name of Elijah, who at this point has done a series of miracles. He outran a chariot that was chasing him down. <laughs> he uh, performed miracles in front of Ahab, and Ahab wants this guy dead. So Elijah made a deal. He said, all right, here's what we're going to do. You get all of your prophets of Baal together, and then I'll show up, just me, and we'll have a competition of whose God uh, is more powerful or who, whose God's more important. I should also mention that there had been a drought in the land for 40 years, 45 years, something like that. So yeah, 40 years without rain. Throughout the entire uh, book of First Kings, there's mentions of people just dying in the middle of the desert of dehydration. It's it's a horrible curse upon the land because of what King Ahab has done. So with that knowledge, Elijah has a competition. And the prophets of Baal come forward and they and the competition is going to be whoever can call down fire from heaven wins. So the prophets of Baal. They get, uh, they take an ox and they lay it on the sacrifice altar and they have these stones built around it and they start screaming and yelling for God to, for their God to bring fire down and it doesn't happen. So they start cutting themselves. They start cutting open animals and pouring blood on it, doing all these sadistic rituals and nothing happens. So then now it's time for Elijah's turn because it says they went all day. They went an entire day and could not call down fire from heaven. So then Elijah says, all right, he has his altar. He says, bring water. So he has men pour water onto the altar. So it's a wet altar. And then he quietly prays and says, God, I ask that you bring down fire. And immediately fire shoots from heaven. It blows up and everything burns up. So now that the people see that Elijah's God's the real God, they kill all of the prophets of Baal. Um, so you have King Ahab standing there again it's been a drought for 40 years king ahab is standing there he just watched his prophets get murdered because they failed and he sees elijah standing there elijah walks up to ahab and looks at one of ahab's servants and says go to the top of the mountain and tell me what you see so his servant goes up there he runs back down and says i see a rain cloud so elijah turns to ahab and says um and it came to pass, he said, behold, there rises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up and say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. From there, Ahab gathered on his chariot and left. Literally, this man killed all of his prophets, called down fire, and then had a servant He's like, go tell me what's up on that hill. He doesn't, Elijah doesn't need to check. He knows it's a rain cloud. So he looks at Ahab and says, get out and don't let the rain stop you. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> it hadn't rained in 40 years. And he said, get out, don't let it stop you. <laughs> like, man, oh, that's my that. favorite. That's my favorite zinger. Anyway, I had to yeah. say that. I, uh, I I wanted to pull up mine because I wasn't able to find it. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go with the the abridged version from um, <laughs> from Daniel uh, 25. But uh, at the at the feast of Balthazar, 
okay. after the hand starts writing on the wall and he's like and Valtor's like what does this mean call call Daniel he'll know uh, and the words written are mene mene tekel uh, upharsin uh, and he says this is the interpretation of these things mene Goth hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it tekel thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting Peris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Balthazar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And what happens immediately after this, the night of, is that Darius the Mede comes in and slaughters Balthazar and all of his people. Like, Daniel basically goes, yep. you're all going to die. And then it happens immediately, yep. which yep. is just yep. insane. Um, I think me and you on a previous episode talked about how Daniel looked at the words, mm -hmm. and before he translated, he looked at him and was like, you idiot, you knew better. Yeah, before he even I, says what the words <laughs> mean, he's like, oh, oh my, he's like, you did it again. <laughs> ah, God, let me see if I can find it again. I'm try I, I know it's in there, I can't remember exactly what he says. Um, let's see, uh, the vision... Um... It's not the vision, it's the hand. Is it hand, right? Um, I'm trying to find it in here, but... Uh, and it was Daniel brought before the king, and the king spake unto son of Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which are the children of captivity of Judah? Um, o thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty, and glory, and honor. And for all the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Who he, whom he would, he slew, and whom he would, he kept alive, and whom he would, he set up, and whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven." till he knew the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men, that he appointeth it over it whomsoever he will. And thou, has, and thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knowest this, but hast lifted thyself up against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, of iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God who in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. And that's right before he translates it. He's basically like, yep. he's like, I'm going to translate this for you, but first I'm going to roast the hell out of you. Yep. Like, yeah, there's just some good lines in there. But the, we... the the entire Bible does that. Elijah. The thing I was mentioning earlier, real quick, is whenever Elijah was with Elisha, mm -hmm. right before Elijah's called up to heaven, and Elijah looks at Elisha and says, "Is there anything I can give you before I leave?" And Elisha says, "I want a double helping of the spirit that God has imparted on you." Mm -hmm. And Elijah says, "Thou hast asked a hard thing." <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally he's like and then he says but i will ask if it can be done literally elijah's about to walk into heaven on a chariot and he's like if you want double what i got that's a that's a whole lot i don't know if that's possible but we'll see. <laughs> he did and that you know that, that elisha's like goal in saying that was like to glorify elijah like the best thing i could possibly have is double what you have and i just like oof i don't know maybe <laughs> like he's like ah shoot, I, I i'm gonna head out uh -huh. I, <laughs> he's like i don't know i'm a pretty cool guy after all <laughs> um I, whenever we were going through acts like uh the stoning of stephen mm -hmm. right i was thinking to myself like that whenever stephen gets arrested it says the pharisees have no idea who he is yeah it says they look at him and he has the countenance of god and they're like what what's the problem with you so i'm like all right whatever i'm about to read Stephen goes from them being like, oh, this guy couldn't hurt anyone to they kill him in the middle of the courtroom, mm -hmm. right? So he's got to say something wild in the next few verses. And sure enough, this guy, right? So Stephen's Jewish, right? And he's in front of a Jewish tribunal, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's the Jewish Pharisees. So he's Jewish and everyone else is Jewish. So he goes, men, let's talk about our history. Mm -hmm. So he goes through the entire Old Testament, 
He talks about Moses, talks about Abraham, Jacob, David. He goes through the whole thing and says, these are my fathers. Your fathers are the Canaanites, the Moabites, the Hit. <laughs> like he just, he lists them off and he says, I am the one who followed God and you are the one who rejected a will of God at the disposition of angels. Like, <laughs> You go to religious leaders and say that they rejected angels to follow their own thing. I'm like, okay, that's why they killed him. <laughs> yeah, Which, yeah, they stoned issue. him. They stoned him to death right there. Yeah, it's such a good speech. But like, there's so there's so many places like that um, in the Bible where just someone just just destroyed with facts and logic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. I, I couldn't. I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, that was so goofy. Arrogant I'm Pharisee destroyed I'm not taking it back. With facts and logic. With facts and logic. <laughs> we'll see who cancels who, Pharisee. Oh, my God. All right. So we do have to get to the super chats. We're going to read through these. we got a bunch of them. Um, Joseph, for $5, said, won't be able to watch today. So I figured I'd throw you all some money. Have fun blaspheming. Well, I hope we didn't do too much of that. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for so the five, at least. For 50 Canadian says, I had questions regarding the unforgivable sin, Matthew 12, 31 to 32. What defines blasphemy against God? If you stop believing in or denounce God and Jesus dying for you when you were younger, but later repented and come back to the faith, what then? I, I mean, my, yeah. my answer regarding apostasy is that the parable of the prodigal son is very clear. Um, if you leave and come back, you are accepted just as if you had never left. As far as blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, um, I think it, it, that, to me, I think of, like, false prophets and false teachers, like, leading people astray and deliberately attempting to prevent mm. others from reaching salvation. Yes. Does I will also sense? clarify, again, in my beliefs, that whenever he talks about blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, he specifically mentions... Uh, those who are of non-believers. Mm -hmm. So essentially the question Jesus was asked is, all right, so we're all sinful, right? So what is the sin that we can commit that won't let us into heaven? And he says the sin of disbelief, essentially, as mm -hmm. in the sin of never repenting for your sins, which was just a way to explain to them salvation. Yeah, there's um, nothing that can keep you. Th there's nothing that can keep you except yourself, yes. essentially, was his purpose in saying that, yeah. yeah I, hi, mm -hmm. I miss him. How's it going, boy? <laughs> Archie decided he needed to be the center of attention again. Um, uh, McDoodly Do for five dollars US says, "I'm excited for this weird Bible live since I missed the last one. Just wanted to say I love both of you guys' work. Sincerely, your number one fan from Belize. We have fans from Aww. Belize. That's so That's sweet. Sick. Thank you so Thank much. You. I appreciate that. That means the world." Uh, Tansy for five US says, "Would you guys be down for talking about Asherah falling down that rabbit hole of research into old faiths? Actually, brought me back to Christianity. Uh, we'll probably almost certainly talk about that whenever we get to Solomon, because he erects a, ta a statue to her." Qu quietly ask which one is Asherah. Asherah is, Asherah <laughs> is uh, in Canaanite mythology. Asherah has got uh, Yahweh's wife. Um, oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, I, Solomon, I, I've heard Solomon that. Solomon erects the a statue to her in the temple. That's is that the one that the Queen of Sheba convinces him to fall for? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I love that David is that. like strong, but not strong enough to resist the temptation of women's sensuality and solomon is wise but not wise enough to resist the temptation of women's sensuality <laughs> i think honest uh, unironically i think that is the message to yeah. us i'm not kidding <laughs> whenever the man after god's own heart and the wisest man who ever lived could not resist women yeah right like, yeah. We, we are we are we are weak we are we are, we are creatures <laughs> of basic order <laughs> and desire to, doesn't get much more complicated no, same thing then same thing now oh. Um, so Phoenix Astapowicz says the Old Testament and the Bible in general is probably the most symbolically rich piece of text in human history. And then can you add all the various interp and then you can add all the various <laughs> interpretations and denominations on top of it. Yes, it is chock full of symbolism. There's so much. And even the things that are literal tend them. to have symbolism associated with them. Yeah. Like I was talking about the Passover yeah. and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, like you said, greatest yeah. story ever told, right? Yep. Dark Saint 1207, 1207. Um, oh, God. 
he knew before he knew. Uh, for 10 US <laughs> says, would the Lore Lodge be willing to do SCP content? I would love to see that. Also, thank you for all you do. Keep on keeping on. Um, I've been considering SCP stuff. I uh, probably is like an additional content segment. Um, probably not in as much depth as we do the folklore stuff or the missing 401 stuff, but I've been thinking about it. Um, I just want to make sure that like we make it clear what we're talking about and I'd have to explain what SCPs are to people because we get a lot of people who watch who don't know what that is. Um, but yeah, I've, I've considered it. Um, be a fun, I'll be a fun iceberg for you to do too if you can find one. Um, I've done an SCP iceberg. Yeah. Oh, okay. Fake fan. Fake fan. I'm Fake sorry. Fan. I haven't <laughs> caught everything you put out over the last two years. No, no, no. You're fine. It was an I old video, but yeah, that's one. I think that's good enough. <laughs> there you, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Uh, the SCP iceberg was a while back. Yeah. Uh, I may do more in the future, but. I have a bit of an issue with the SCP universe as it's currently done. It's so, it's just the nature of like collaborative writing projects. It is so hit or miss with quality yeah, or true. interest across the, the board. Some of them are incredible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's just, which is why I really like um, things like, There's another series that isn't collaborative but similar to SCP. Okay, like Local 58? I'll co- it'll come to me in a second. Okay. I'm sorry. Continue. Yeah. I'm dumb. Uh, Matt, Gli- Matt Gliatoni says for 5 US, Jesus turned the water into Red Bull like you did with the wine. <laughs> Moses drank it, and that's how he parted the Red Sea. Also, love your shoes, guys. D- Do you mean didn't shows? we... No shoes. They meant okay. shoes. Um, I mean, they are. The, to to <laughs> kind of derail. Do not get, start getting your feet up on camera. They won't let us stop. They're closed. Um, to start, didn't last podcast or two ago you discovered that there's a Beyblade episode where they yes. say Moses part of the Red Sea with the Beyblade. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Broke me. And the Gavoir for five Canadians says, I hope I hop into the stream and I immediately hear the motto of Exodus is no gang loyalty. Yep, pretty much how my university Bible studies went. <laughs> uh, can't prove us wrong on that one. It's literally how it went. Just because you make the Bible super colloquial does not make you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Blasphemous, perhaps, yes. but not wrong. <laughs> uh, as long as you make it clear what you're doing, it's fine. Unlike the NIV. They pretend to be a real Bible. <laughs> um, William Wood for 20 US says, I've been binging this series and I love it. It has reinvigorated my drive to learn more about scripture. Thank you all so much. Thank you. That is what we want to hear. That's Aww, that's very sweet. That's what that's Shit. why we do this is we feel like it, it brings the Bible to an audience that perhaps abandoned it or uh, doesn't want to sit through, you know, dry lectures on it. It's, you know, it's more fun to learn. It, 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 it Some people just need to learn about it through something that's a little bit more like fun and you know, then you go do the Bible study on your own when you got the time. You know, fact check us. <laughs> um, Matt Gliatone for again for US two says uh, the Ark of the Covenant was the thunder gun from Black Ops one. That was all as one word. <laughs> I think you broke Isaiah. You've upset him deeply. <laughs> this is usually the response he has to me. <laughs> yeah. I hope you. I hope you know. Whenever you get to heaven, that that's going to be on playback. So good luck explaining that one. You got the rest of your life to think about that. Continue. I do think that would be an amazing skit in the style of whitest kids you know, like people getting to the pearly gates and Saint Peter, just like giving them PowerPoint presentations on why they're not getting into heaven. Uh, like, <laughs> Rip Trevor Moore. Um, yeah. But uh, Dark Saint twelve seven for five says, Aiden, can you please give a current upload schedule day for, specifically for the podcast? I like to try and catch you guys live more often. We try to do this. We make a valiant attempt to do this the last Thursday of every month. I'm going to. Uh, I have to run to the bathroom really quick. It'll Go be for one it. second. But but uh, to answer, it's all Aiden's fault. Blame him. No. <laughs> no. I'm it, it all ser- it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness. Uh, I am very bad at c- communicating, getting a hold of people. Because I have, if I have a video or a project working on, like it's been the Kickstarter lately for the movie, um, I-, I will see a message or a DM. This is with ads, videos, anything about another project, and I'm like, 
I will get to that when my brain is done doing this. Because I, if I get sidetracked, this will never get done. So if I see something unrelated, I'm like storing later, as, and as then a, I finish what I'm content doing. Creator, I, I can say the amount of work that Isaiah does is utterly insane. The frequency of videos I, I and the length that. and the depth. I'm I'm getting into that point now where I'm like that's the kind of level of research that's going into our new stuff, and it is. It's a lot. <laughs> like, I, I appreciate I appreciate your kindness, uh, but it is entirely my fault because uh, Aiden will message me like, "Hey, when are we going to do this?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'll get to him right when I'm done with this." And three days later, I'm like, "I, I need to get back to the, that." I so, just bug yeah. him every few yeah. days when I need something. <laughs> I, unironically, if you want to get a hold of me, you have to spam me. <laughs> it is the only way to get progress. That's true. Uh, that, anyway, I'm going to run the bathroom. All right. I'll keep reading through these. Um, all right. Uh, Shrinking Christy just sent us $10. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, Surfing Cowboy for US5 said, best alternate reality, or best argument? Oh, I read ARG as alternate reality game. I am in too deep. Um, Best argument for the Trinity is that it is impossible to understand. An ant will never understand computer programming. How are we supposed to understand God? Agreed. It's something along those lines. Like, we can try, but there's certain stuff scientifically that we don't understand. Uh, so why do we understand everything religiously? I don't get quantum physics. I don't know that quantum physicists get quantum physics. Um, Polygon for Canadian five says Christianity as a religious movement is man's best attempt to reflect and embody God's perfection. That is basically how, how we feel about it is we are doing our best to understand and we will fail. And there are times when we're going to get things wrong and that's okay. The goal, the, the point is that you're always trying to be better. You're always trying to improve and be the best person you can, no matter what. Um, and I think that's the essence of Christianity as a, as a belief system is that you're going to fail. And I think when I think about sin, I don't think about man being inherently sinful as a, a something I should be ashamed of. I think it is, you know, it's almost comforting that no matter what I do, I will never be perfect. And God accepts that. So I would rather be imperfect and accepted than perfect and have never really done anything to achieve it, you know? Um, not J. Edgar Hoover. That's suspicious. <laughs> for Five says, hey, Aiden and Wendigoon, thank you for both for producing the content you do. I'm a local semi-driver and use both your content to stay alert and entertain. Well, thank you. I'm glad that we are helping Aww. you to uh, do one of the most important jobs in the country. Um, unironically yeah yeah uh without without truckers we would all be living a much different life so thank you for doing what you're doing um J not jager we were said again for 10 uh i know you've both expressed interest in dmt and i did it for a year consistently good lord how are you alive how did how have you not broken man man went to mars for a year is what he means the man has been chilling Lord. with the clockwork elves more than more than humans um <laughs> And have an interesting experience. If you want to hear about my experience, you are welcome to reach out to me. If you shoot me an email at thelorelodge at gmail.com, I will read it. I make no promises about when, but I will read it. Uh, I went. Uh, I don't know if you have something like that, Wendigoon. Say that one more time. I was reading chat. Oh, do you have uh, a, a email inbox that he could send this to you? Or I could just forward it along if he sends it to me. Uh, you can forward it along because I'm really bad about checking my emails, but sure, my we'll email <laughs> is, uh, windagoon, like windagoon, at streamworks.gg. Streamworks.gg? Streamworks. Oh, right, you got Str management now. I got management, yeah, uh, they just managed my ads. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of the email is for ads to come through, but that's also where people send stuff. Uh, so like, but, uh, and I stress this to anyone because people do not know this. Any email you sent me can be viewed by me and my entire management staff. So whenever people send me really weird emails, <laughs> I'm not the only one who sees those. Okay, so Wendigoon so, will be getting a whole bunch of weird emails from accounts that are bro, definitely people, not me. Huh? This is <laughs> thank you. Aiden. I'll write you. This is it. This is the place. Cosmic horror love letters. Hate you. This isn't the place to talk about it, uh, because you know we're doing Q and A and stuff. But I get the weirdest. I would just... imagine so. Oh man. And anyway, continue. <laughs> uh, Heavy Burn Man for ten. It said, "And on the redacted day, God gaveth us frog." I love that one. Uh, Anthe Guar says, "For five Canadian, nice to see other Christians who like scary stuff." Have you ever run into people who think liking horror is satanic, though? Yes, I have. 
I have come across so many in, people. In the Bible Belt, I've met several. Uh, yeah. Up here in Pennsylvania, I've met several. So it's like it is not uncommon, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I understand that there's like I wouldn't live with demonic imagery like yeah. some people do. I feel a little I feel like that's in poor taste, but um I mean, it's not. I'm, I don't watch a movie with like The Conjuring and be like, "Oh man, I wish I was with the demons." <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> it's supposed to bother me. That's yeah. the point. <laughs> I don't. I don't watch it because I'm looking up to these people who get possessed. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not taking notes like, "Oh, they're good I'm stuff." Laughing yeah, at like, their pain. Um, yeah, yeah much. <laughs> <laughs> laughing at the mistakes they have made. Uh, uh -huh, Gentile. <laughs> <laughs> the man, the legend, not the myth, just the man, the legend. Uh, 499 <laughs> says, wanted to say that I'm reading the Bible right alongside these streams. These are great recaps. The humor is fantastic. Please keep doing this. Well, thank you. We appreciate That's that. That's very uh, sweet. Thank you very much. Yeah, and we will keep doing it. Um, Dovin Doragon for 10 says, appreciate what you guys do. It's got me interested in the Bible again. Question for you two. My grandmother and I have experienced phantom sounds like footsteps and doors. What's your guys' opinion on it? What about you, Isaiah? Because I have thoughts. <laughs> I'm sure you have thoughts. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I'm hesitant to most of it uh, because I think that a lot of the stories of spirits and possessions and whatnot are demonic in nature, or at least the legit ones. Um, so to that degree, I don't know. Well, I, I, I guess that's just the simplest answer. I don't know. I don't yeah. know what a demon's objective would be there, but I'm also not going to claim to be knowledgeable enough to know what they want. So I, I just don't know. I know as a Christian, I don't have to worry about it, uh, which is nice, but. So my, we, we just covered the Annabelle doll um, last week. So mm. this is, this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Mm. Uh, and we're going to be talking about Heaven's Gate, the cult this weekend. Um, so uh, that's just so people know what, what's up on Sunday, uh, 7 p.m. But uh, yeah, as far as footsteps and phantom sounds go, on the one hand, you got to remember that your brain tries to interpret everything it hears. So your your ears catch a signal of something and your brain tries to interpret it. So part of it's pattern seeking. You might hear, you know, and your brain interprets it as footsteps, even though it could be something completely separate. But at the same time, in cases of uh, demonic infestations and possessions and all of that, I, a lot of uh, the the tactic seems to be uh, if you if you follow demonology um, that they that demons will do stuff like this to get you to call a medium or to get you to try and do a seance or something like that. Their goal is to not get you to call a priest to your house, and they will focus in particularly given the opportunity on non believers on people who are susceptible to it. New age religion, um, you know, uh, you know groups like that, and the goal is to get you to call a medium because a demon can lie to you and happily will so whereas you know if, if you believe in ghosts ghosts are basically just spectral loops whereas a demon is a an intelligent inhuman evil entity that will lie to you in order to get you to invite it into your home and then you know either possess you or it might try and get you to worship it um i think a lot of cult activity is inspired by demonic presence um you know i'm i'm very much the kind of person who believes in this stuff so uh, someone, someone said get Shapiro in the chat. Someone said that Moses had a Pokemon battle with Pharaoh's servants. It's not entirely inaccurate, I guess. Shut up. Just keep reading. Don't justify it. I just had to mention <laughs> that so everyone could make fun of them. Uh, Jack Manson for 20 says, have either of you two ever played Far Cry 5? If so, what do you think of the villains? I have not played it. I do Keep get the gist. By your side. That, that's the problem is I hear that song and I'm like I I honestly <laughs> look I'll, I'll I'll be straight with you. I don't know if they were just if the developers were really good at making a uh compelling villain or if someone on the team is secretly really cool. I <laughs> guess <laughs> Ever now, I know they like kidnapped people in the beginning <laughs> cutscene, right? But for the rest of the story, I'm like, these guys are awesome. I gotta play the this whole game, game. It, bro. You're playing it? 
okay so like you're playing it and you're hunching through the woods and then you'll see like these women in white robes with ars and they're singing like step into the garden <laughs> we're gonna lock the gate like all of these fantastic music about uh a funny story, actually. If you listen to my Waco video at mm-hmm. the intro and outro, I'm playing the uh, Keep Your Rifle By Your Side I song. I love that. Yeah, very loudly. Um, I remember when I was editing it, I was like, I wonder if I can slip this in. So I uploaded an unlisted video of that song, and it didn't get demonetized. I'm like, Ooh, I know oh, what I'm doing. Yeah. I love that. Oh, man. Yeah, that, I mean, that, I, like, I listen to the song, it's so and I'm good. like, this is a bop. Like, it's not bad. <laughs> Bro, that whole album's a bop, I tell you what. Um, but to, to, to answer unironically, they are bad people because they do violent things and they <laughs> manipulate people for them. And obviously their doctrine lifts himself or lifts Joseph Seed up as a hero. So he's, you know, he's wrong. That being said, the aesthetics are so cool. Like the like all the game's artwork of like a white church in the middle of the mountains with like guys out front with shotguns and stuff. That reminds me of home. That's that's the that's literally what you, I grew up in. You look at it and you're like, okay, there's this beautiful white church and all of these like happy looking people in this idyllic landscape armed to the teeth like i, I yeah. this is a paradise <laughs> yeah this is this is this is where i grew up literally <laughs> i could be one of them yeah so, yeah uh, and ironically they're bad people but the aesthetic is so cool yeah anyway that's there's a lot of that in history unfortunately the bad guys seem to have the cooler fashion uh, yeah. i don't know <laughs> uh although i will say the the american pink and greens the american dress uniforms from world war ii are they're pretty the, mean the nazis pretty did mean. not have anything on the americans in that department um yeah but uh let's see uh darren king for 10 says as a christian i'm unsure how to feel about capital punishment i lean in my heart toward no capital punishment but many make a case for it being biblical what are your thoughts thanks for the vid i'll defer to you first on this one thank you i love how you do that Um, I, i can take it so uh it's my problem with capital punishment isn't people dying it's the state deciding who dies <laughs> because i'm not Valid. a fan of the, i'm not a fan of their decisions that being said there are several times in new testament and old testament as well where um people don't get to exist with us anymore there's a difference between you know turning the other cheek and allowing someone to commit the same atrocities again so yeah um, i think i think in the context of i i would never agree with sentencing someone to death on the basis of them committing a sin or something that is up to god to judge not us but certain things um certain things that are against the uh the laws of man i think i would i would be fine with capital punishment so long as it was proven beyond a reasonable doubt like uh, again the state is not a reliable actor but if you catch somebody red-handed um you know doing a certain kind of thing to a child i i do not think that those people deserve to live um exactly so i think in that case you know i uh forgive me father but (laughs) i I can't let that one slide um i would rather face my punishment from god than allow somebody like that to continue living on this earth um you know children children are sacred and should be protected at all costs well, Jesus said if, if anyone were to harm a child, it would be better for a millstone to be wrapped around his neck and he'd be drowned in the depths of the sea. All right. So personally, this is a much farther step down from that. So. Also, I mean, there is, you know, if any man does not have a sword, sell his cloak and buy one, does not really yeah. make Christianity into a totally pacifist religion where you're not supposed but, to harm oh, there, there is a huge disconnect between turning the other cheek for a mm-hmm. brethren and safeguarding yourself and your family yeah, you're not supposed people, to just let yourself die you're, yeah you're not supposed to just roll over that was very apparent um a lot of the apostles were called to that because they put themselves into such dangerous situations and knew that their death would mean more than their life mm-hmm. example like stephen um that does not mean that every Christian who follows is supposed to just lay down and take it. Exactly. Um, let's see. Uh, Problematic Farmer for 10 says, we love a good retelling of the Passover story. It's true. Uh, Natalie is Jewish, so I think she feels represented. <laughs> <laughs> um, Winged Warrior for 20 says, love you both from Oklahoma. Question for both as well, if it's not too personal. Is there a time recently that you've questioned your faith? Thank you for even reading. Um, question faith. I mean, there's been a number of times in my life 
where I questioned it. Uh, I think probably the most recent would be maybe early 2021. Um, kind of felt like my life was falling apart and it wasn't going anywhere. I was in a dead end job. My girlfriend had just broken up with me. Um, you know, it was just a dark place. It was a, a rough spot to be in. And I remember because I, I, I remember very specifically when she and I started dating and um, I, I realized how much I cared about her. I I started praying every morning. First thing I did, I take this off when I sleep because I don't want to accidentally choke myself with it. But uh, first thing I do every morning um, to this day is I wake up and I wrap this around my neck and I hold it and I say a brief prayer. But every morning of every day, I would pray for one more day with that girl. Um, and of course, I wanted to be with her forever, but I was like, I'm going to ask for one more day. That seems reasonable. And then the day came where there wasn't one more day. And I just remember like in that moment thinking like, mm -hmm. I have been the best man I can be. I have been the best Christian I can be. What have I done wrong? Why is God taking this from me? Uh, so I definitely questioned it in that moment. But almost two years later, uh, that was December 30th of 2020. Um, a few years later, I, I recognize if that girl hadn't broken up with me, I never would have decided to go to grad school, which means I never would have quit my job, which means I never would have been sitting around mm -hmm. randomly viewing TikToks at 4 p.m. on June 12, 2021, which means that my first TikTok video that went viral never would have happened, which means that I would not be sitting here with Isaiah today. Um, mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you know, those things that make you question your faith, year and a half, two years later, you might look back on them and totally get it. Mm. I can, uh, uh, yeah, um, I, that was really good. I appreciate that. Um, I've been in similar situations where trials have uh, made me question stuff. Uh, maybe not so much like, is God real? But maybe like, why is this happening? I don't deserve this, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what you have to realize is that as a Christian, God has a plan for us. We're, we're his children. He has laid out things. And a lot of the times we'll pick stuff or we'll choose things in our future that we think are for the best. Like, this is what I want, so this is it. But from what we've decided to hold on to, God's perfect plan can't be enacted. So a lot of the times, God will take away what we want in order to give us what we need. Um, and I can say from experience, I've had a lot of stuff that I thought was what I wanted fall apart on me so that something much greater can be built up. Uh, and I know that God has, um, I can only imagine how great the girl that God has for Aiden's going to be when they come along. And I can say from my own experience, um, that God, God's ways are not our ways. So while we don't always know what the puzzle is before it's finished, it is always worth it in the end. Um, so yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's God works in mysterious ways. You're not going to get it at first, but those moments when you question your faith the most, those are probably the ones that you're going to look back on and totally get it. You're like, yeah. could be years yeah. later, but you'll get them. Um, we have Joshua Medeiros for two says the Bible explained in Gen Z memes. Yes. Rename um, the podcast. <laughs> yeah. who's, the, who's the older one out of the two of us? I'm turning 25 I'm, this year. You're older. Okay. I'm 23. Yeah. Um, turning 25 and I'll be in Nashville when I do it. Um, Mm -hmm. Better come buy me a drink. <laughs> uh, I will. I'll be there. I'll be there. A very overpriced Jack Daniels. Good lord! I was there a couple weekends ago. And they were selling Jack for twelve dollars a shot. I'm like the the distillery's right there, man. This is twenty three dollars a bottle where I live. What are you doing? I I I don't drink, but I have friends who do, and uh, one of them was in Nashville, and they I don't know how drinking things work, but like a bucket of. Think Miller Lite or mm -hmm. something like a bucket of just normal beer on ice, which was like six to eight bottles, maybe sixty dollars. Yeah, that's insane. No, nope. yeah, <laughs> mm -mm. ridiculous. Uh, that's why I don't like cities. Everything's overpriced. Uh, the last time I was in Nashville, I saw a man going down the side of the sidewalk mm -hmm. in a wheelchair, and half of his head was scalped. So it was just like the bone. You could see his whole skull, like a giant patch of it. And he was just wheeling up and down the road. And he, he it was on like his left side, right? So first time he passed us and he's like, change, change. And when that doesn't work, he's like, okay. So it goes the other way and he's exposing the skull. And I, I was obviously stunned. I'm like, how, <laughs> like pointing at my friends. How do you survive um, that? It looked like it was an infection or something. He 
I think he was homeless. Well, yeah, it probably. looked like an infection or something that had just spread to where it was like a lot of the skin was like ate up because the borders of it were like dark kind of scabbed looking around. It did not uh, look healthy. Yeah. But as he's going down the street, a girl sees him like a college girl and she screams, you know, she turns and goes, ah! and he goes for $10. I'll let you touch it. <laughs> immaculate sense of humor on that man make make your coin get your bag my man <laughs> you know what i i who <laughs> that story had a lot of twists i was not prepared for <laughs> yeah so you know they got the overpriced miller light and dudes with no scalp um who are Welcome to, Nashville. to touch it okay wow <laughs> Uh, Nick Perfetti for $10 says, have you guys ever heard of the book Born in Blood by John J. Robinson? It's a book about Masonic history, and I think it's right up your alley. As Mason myself, I'd love to see all's thoughts on the book. I'll take a look at it. I've got a whole bunch of Masonic stuff to read through, but I will take a look at it. <laughs> uh, Clay Costner for two said, message retracted. Thank you, Clay. Uh, <laughs> is Thorn Bussy in here? Oh my god, he is. Um, let's see, uh, five dollars big warrior says, by the way, Wendy, I've watched every video. Please make more. Can't wait for stalker. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Uh, new video. I try to do three a month. Uh, so hopefully another video by the end of the month and stalker will be out in a while, but thank you so much. I appreciate that. Oh. Um, let's see Phoenix Ostapowicz for Canadian five says for Wendigoon. If you need a video topic, I sent you a very long, weird email about a Canadian Christian eco terrorist a bit ago. See, those are the kind of emails. I'm... No, I'm kidding. That actually sounds very <laughs> that's cool. An email you that's want to get. Like, that, that's the kind I want to get. Yeah. So can, thank you. I will check it out. That's can very you forward cool. a copy to me? Cause I kind of want to read this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious now. Christian eco terrorist. And definitely not me. Don't look. I already checked. It's not me. <laughs> I was it this podcast where I said if I look up in the sky and see a billboard, I'm becoming a terrorist. People no, send that I to me like once so. a week. I think it was I, like it was an early episode, maybe where we were talking about how like Elon Musk wants to put like sky billboards, like oh, these big yeah, bands. Yeah, you're right. I remember now. Yeah, and I said if I ever look up in the sky at night and see a McDonald's ad, I'm becoming a terrorist. <laughs> That gets clipped and the sent to me. Revolutions the, of, the revolutions the industrial ads. revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. Yes, correct. Oh, boy. Um, oh, Uncle. Oh, you want to have something else? I may be doxing myself a little bit, but that's fine. I found out that my cousin worked the Ted Kaczynski case. Oh, no way. He was an FBI investigator. Yeah. You have a cousin who's part a fed? I know. That was uh, the twist no. I did not expect. <laughs> <laughs> Wendigoon Fed confirmed. Wendigoon Fed confirmed. It's the all confirmed. The four chain conspiracies yeah. came true. You're right. The, the hair was too nice. Yeah. Uh, searching your did name on 4chan is an experience. It isn't it though? It's the worst of the worst. Um, Dos Nachos 102 for two says, Thank you, Archie, for licking my hand. That's very nice. Um, yeah, he's a very giggle boy. He's very lovely. Uh, are tattoos taboo? I heard somewhere they are. I have heard it go both ways on this. Um, I mean, I I have one, so <laughs> I, I don't I don't know particularly. Do you have thoughts on that? Um, I when it comes to sins, not sin, like uh, actions or whatever that directly affect you and no one else. I really could care less. They couldn't care less than to teach people on it. So, yeah, it's I, I, yeah. I, I kind of see the argument that, you know, your body is a temple and we're made in God's image. But at the same time, yeah. um, you know, this body is temporary. Yeah, I, I really don't yeah, feel so. one way or the other because you could argue until the cows come home about, well, in Leviticus, it says this and someone else be like, well, uh, so scars, do those count? And like, just yeah, it's just not yeah, going to yeah. You, you can go in circles all day, yeah. Yeah, um, I think that maybe a tattoo that is like 
anti-god would probably not be great but yeah maybe don't get a pentagram yeah. but that's <laughs> well if you get a pentagram because it symbolizes the five wounds of christ you're probably fine but um okay. Okay. if you get a pentagram because uh, it represents satanism because of anton LeVay don't get a go ahead a... don't get a go ahead yeah. is that better is yes. that better aiden a- is that okay LeVay all right makes me all right. so upset because he basically took a bunch of christian and celtic pagan and masonic symbols and was like haha these are satanists now and in the 80s Correct, people yeah. believed him um, I wish the unironically. I wish the upside down cross was still a Christian symbol. Yeah, it's cool. It's, it's cool. Yeah, I like the idea behind it. Uh, but no, no, it's satanic. <laughs> um, can get a fish. Can always get a little fish. It's the first symbol of Christianity. Yeah, I do like the little fish. What's it called? The ichthys. The ichthys. Yeah, or whatever. something like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, it's the the original Christian symbol. Of men. Yeah. Archie, you are a majestic animal. Um. Commander Canada for two dollars Canadian, appropriate, says, uh, "What is good and what have I missed? The Exodus, or at least the lead up to it, and lots of plagues. <laughs> Possibly a monumental discovery about the timing of all of this, but I'm not going to toot my own horn too much on that one until I am certain of it. At which point, I will toot my own horn quite a bit. <laughs> if I got that right, I am going to be such a pain in the ass." <laughs> Dovin Dorigon for two says ran out of time at work. Uh, at the moment, this was at our church. What do you mean this was at our church? I'm not sure what that means. Did they mean they were playing this at a Wednesday night or Thursday night Bible thing? That would be awesome. I would. That love would be really to, cool. I would love to. That Very would be cool. Oh no! Well, I don't want some of what we say to be repeated <laughs> in the sanctuary. <laughs> As long as like it's the in like the off the church campus, like yeah, if, it, if, it's in, if it's in your church gym or whatever, That's like your okay. little fellowship hall, sure. The chapel, why not? maybe not so much. The sanctuary, please no. <laughs> I'm begging you. Uh, Born confused for five says next week I'm going to Japan for I have three to, oh. years. Hmm? Sorry, go ahead. I, I don't want to ruin this donation. Go ahead, three right. years. <laughs> and I will miss your live streams. You upload them somewhere so I can watch them afterwards. Yes, they're all here on YouTube. They yep, are. You can catch all of them. You know, how, we've done a lot of them at this yeah, point. This so is the sixth one. Yeah, they will continue to be here. Yep. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Yeah. And you can find uh, okay. uh, Isaiah's appearances on my normal Sunday show going back to like late 2020, probably this time 2021. We've been doing this a while. Yeah. There's quite a few. He, he's yeah. popped onto a few of those. And, and now we do this one because it kind of distills it and allows us to talk about some yeah. really cool stuff. More focus. So. Yeah. Um, I, well, I have to. Uh, the sanctuary thing made me think. At church, uh, I was talking to the pastor's wife mm-hmm. about. I hate saying conjuring this. If this is being played in a sanctuary, turn it off right now. Um, the pastor's wife said, "Like, yeah, the the kids were going to school with these new kids." I don't know what they are. They're called furries. Oh no! And she, she was a hundred percent innocent. Had never heard the word before. And was like, do you know what that is? And we were standing at the door to the sanctuary, and I, I, I like looked around and I grabbed her shoulders and shuffled three feet out of the sanctuary. I was like, a furry is. A- <laughs> Hold on, not in the Lord's house. No, 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 no. We're moving over here. Uh, she, she thought it was very funny, and so did I. But please don't play this. <laughs> thank you. Also, born confused. Thank you for for what you're doing. Your job is very important, um, and, you know, it, it's – I know military people don't like to hear thank you for your service, but, you know, you're doing something very oh, important. I, I, very love, I love doing it to my friends all the time. They hate it. It's the best. <laughs> um, Squid Facts for five says, as a non-religious person, these videos are genuinely interesting, and any news about that mold video? Mold video? Yeah, they're refer. I'm pretty sure they're referring to. I mentioned in a few interviews that the worst uh, iceberg, the dumbest iceberg, is someone sent me a mold iceberg. It's like cover various molds, and uh, so so now I'll get comments that are like, "Yeah, when's the mold iceberg? Huh? The mold iceberg. When's that coming out? It any time now. Any just day. wait. Be- February the thirtieth. Uh, February the thirtieth. Just wait. It's coming. It'll the mold iceberg is coming. coming. It'll be there. It's going to go on my story fire. <laughs> It'll be sure to blow the whole uh, lid. I, one of our, one of our, the guys who, the guy who actually wrote our theme song um, said, just had the chance to pop in for a second. And man, what a wholesome moment to catch. I do not know 
what moment he's talking about. Although, based on the surrounding chats, I think it was when we were talking about uh, God working in mysterious ways and moments you doubt your faith. Mm. Um, the the only unironically beautiful moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, there's a couple more. Okay. Phoenix Ostapowicz says, oh, and he was possibly set up and framed by the RCMP. Interesting. The this actually, this actually is a video. This is actually a video that, yeah, uh, a, a Christian eco terrorist set up by the government is very so up, much up my alley. See, I might do that. If it was by the American government, there would be nothing special about that. But I am loving the fact that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were like, "Hey, what's this about, eh? We are shut you down. <laughs> <laughs> You're no, messing no, with no the terrorists. syrup and lumber industries, aren't you?" <laughs> Don't you know? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I'll check it out. That is up my alley. Listen, my cousin Davey is a moose, and he would not be happy about this. Um, about this, sorry. Uh, uh, Nick Perfetti for five, in addition to my other super chat, Born in Blood is about the theorized connection between the Templars and the Masons. That is what I plan on doing my graduate research on, so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I want to write my, uh, my graduate thesis for my master's, which I'm starting... God, on Monday? Uh, <laughs> that's terrifying. Uh, I want to write that on the way that Freemason ideology influenced the American Revolution. And then for my PhD research, I'm looking into doing, you know, how, how were the Templars connected to the Masons and were they actually? And does that connection remain today? Um, and what does that mean for the United States and for England and all of these countries who had serious Masonic thought involved in their foundings? Um, Winged Warrior for two. And to stir the pot before I go... Giants in all caps. Giants. Yeah. Um, speaking of giants, I am very, very much looking forward to them bottoming out the NFC East this year. Because um, <laughs> when thank you're an you. Eagles fan, all you really have is thank God we're not them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> man, the the sex bots are just all over this today. Someone clip that, please. Oh my God, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh the channel with no name for two dollars says what are y'all's religions love your videos wendy i am a methodist wesleyan methodist not uh united methodist um i, I don't i'm baptist I, I like teach sunday school at a baptist but but as long as you're like don't believe in a priest and believe in christ crucified we're the same thing so okay. yeah yeah i'm very similar it's Methodism is basically like where doctrine contradicts, where dogma contradicts scripture, default to the scripture. Um, yeah, that's kind yeah. of our, our general. Uh, Dove and Dragon, ah, I lost it. Where'd it go? Dove and Dragon for five says, We experienced these phantom sounds at our church multiple times, is what you were trying to say. Ah, you kept getting caught by Walmart customers. Are you at Walmart right now? Um, you're experiencing that at the church. That shouldn't happen. <laughs> you say it like a plumber. Like, you got a leak there. That shouldn't be there. That's, uh, that's not right. Um, can, you, can you send me an email with the details of this? And I will, I will see if I can shed some light. If not, um, I know some priests you might want to talk to. Uh, but, yeah, uh, send me the details. Thelorelodge at gmail.com. Um, I will, I will take a look. Um, uh, Invalid Usurper says, I think Wendigoon was trying to think of the hypnagogic archive earlier when they were talking about SCP stuff. That sound right? That wasn't it. I know the hypnagogic archive, but I did a video on it, but that's not what I was trying to think of. I was trying to think of a, an S, a, a collaborative writing thing that is much more quality controlled between entries and i cannot remember what it is for the life of me <laughs> You're so, fine. Okay, i may have just way. made it up honestly because it's not <laughs> one of those like tip of my tongue things it's like a gap in knowledge like I, what i imagine alzheimer's is like like <laughs> ah there was something there not anymore <laughs> everywhere at the end of time <laughs> 
Uh, the Foxo Gaming for two says, why is the book of Job so whack? It's funny you ask that. We have an entire whoa, podcast. Whoa, 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 what a coincidence. We almost <laughs> saw like we talked about for four yeah, hours. The one from last month is four hours long about Job. So uh, I will That's allow a pretty good us one. to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> Pass it over to me, yeah. Yeah, Nat, come on. You dropped the ball. You, you left and the bot came back. <laughs> Grow up. Be better. Be better. Try harder. Also, problematic farmer's profile picture Sarah Lynn from BoJack. So every time they say something, I think of it in Sarah Lynn's voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, I think that about gets to the end of the Super Chats. Um, do you see anything here you have a burning desire to answer? No, nah, that's uh, that's uh, about it from the look of it. Uh, just people saying their normal cursed content. If I, if Throughout the podcast, I'm always like looking away. That's because mm. I'm reading chat as we're talking. Yeah. I've pulled up on my phone. Um, oh, and it's so normally just the standard insanity. Uh, I'm apparently, sure I'm done. getting my own out of context video soon. I'm so proud. Oh, God. You made it. I'm scared. <laughs> I'm a little scared. <laughs> uh. Alex says, when did you go on an earlier video of either the Weird Bible podcast or just a Lore Lodge podcast, you mentioned a not deer encounter. That would have been a probably a Lore Lodge and probably from... That's not, that's almost definitely Lore Lodge. That's yeah. a long time ago. Um, yeah. Do you I think that was last? actually... Yeah, I do, I do remember the... Well, I know what story I told, but I think I remember telling that on our first episode yeah, ever. That's right. That would have been... The sure. timing would have lined up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was the story. I think I told you about it. like it was just a deer that's like head rotated independent of the rest of its body. Yeah, it like trotted off the road, and uh, it, it was probably just CWD. But yeah. it was like it, it was one of those. Uh, I was in high school. It was horrifying. <laughs> yeah. Also, I like how people are like, ah, oh, that's not that's not something supernatural or mysterious. That's just chronic wasting disease, a prion disease that we don't know how it works, and it's terrifying. And if you eat the meat, you might get it too. Like, how is that better? How is that also not creepy and mysterious? Like, that's not better than supernatural. That's Thanks. equally I feel supernatural. So mu- I feel so much better. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and by the way, it's spreading, and we don't know how to control it. Like, but, uh, don't worry, it's not magical. It's just worse. <laughs> incurable prion why didn't you just say that now it's fine yeah. it's not that doesn't make me feel better like sure it's not a demon but i wish it was huh? oh someone said uh is aiden freemasons yes he yes. regularly eats babies Correct. all the time yeah, it's my all the time. they're, they're delicious yeah um yeah. yes i am uh i'm a third degree master mason in baby eater Lodge, and i am a uh <laughs> <laughs> and I am a Mark Master Mason in the Royal Arch in York, right? Um, working on getting up the ladder there. Uh, but it's I, I messed up and accidentally told him I was going to Wales and then changed my mind. And it set my timeline off a little bit. Um, let's see. Uh, will this episode be on Spotify? Now that we've got like six of these, I actually might go over and put them on Spotify. We should discuss how we're going to how we could go about that. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know Spotify stuff. As a matter of fact, there's someone who's not me who claims to be me on Spotify and just re-uploads all my videos over there. And I just, I don't care. Weird. Someone wants to, if if my view is if someone, if there's enough of a market that someone can pretend to be me and do better than me at it, then I either need to get better at that market or let them do their thing. Yeah. And I do not have the time or the forte right now to learn Spotify. So the future he can do his thing and if i ever start uploading i'm not going to take that guy down like he's just uploading videos yeah um but that yeah like for now there's a f- not windagoon over <laughs> on spotify so yeah we could upload these before someone else does yeah i can i can do that um it's easy yeah. enough uh with anchor and all that although i'm probably switching over to podbean because anchor won't monetize me um, see, these are new words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Winged Warrior 95 for five says, thank you guys again. Please keep making people happy. You're doing more good than you realize. Bye bye. Thank you, Winged Warrior. And, uh, you know, it ain't no lie, baby. Bye bye bye. Hey, stop. I'm begging you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lore Lodge is on Spotify. To, to answer another question I just saw. Yes, Lore Lodge is on Spotify. And to answer the question, what is CWD? I don't totally understand it, but it's chronic wasting disease. And essentially, it is a disease that um, 
causes your brain to melt, I guess, and you stop like responding to things like pain and other sensations, and you basically become a zombie. So it's a real life zombie disease. Um, people are talking about Jordan Peterson. Somebody called me a fed. Why am I? A yeah, fed? so pretty, pretty standard. Everything's pretty standard uh, right now. Going well. Uh, da, 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 da. But yeah, um, somebody said respect the commitment to the free market. <laughs> Over what? You allowing the other dude to upload stuff. <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's it's a free market. Like, if someone can be me better than I can be me, that's my problem, not his. So, yeah. That's what, like, my dad, whenever I started YouTube, my dad didn't really get it at first. He does now. But first he was like, dude, you have to trademark your name right now or else someone will steal it and pretend to be you. And I was like, dad, if someone can make the name Windigoon and re-upload my videos and do better than me, I have a big problem. Yeah, and it's true. not that this guy's doing it. Uh, But, yeah, yeah, I feel the same way, like. I'm not gonna I think it's a bad idea for him to if if like that's his bag, mm -hmm. like yeah, uh just copying mine. someone else, that's gonna eventually wind up bad for him, but I'm not gonna be the one to do it. Exactly. All right. Well, we're getting close to ten PM, so this is approaching a three hour podcast, and I know both of us <laughs> need sleep. So thank mm -hmm. you all so much for watching. Um we will try to get this to happen again in September on the last Thursday of the month. I think with a a month in advance and also the knowledge that we're probably just going to do the next part of Exodus, I think that's helpful. We should be able to pull that off. Um, and, uh, you know, if you are interested in the, the Heaven's Gate stuff that we're going to be talking about on Sunday, uh, come back to this channel Sunday at 7 p.m. and we'll be talking about that. Um, and do you have any timeline on when your next video is coming out? Hopefully the 30th, 29th or 30th, like last day or two of this month. Um, and <clears throat> no word on topic yet, because I'm still bouncing around a couple of ideas, but yeah. All right. There you, go. you can see it coming up. Uh, I do want to really quickly answer the question. Alex Corp said, how do I stop the continued conversations of the Wendussie in my myths and legends class? I'm scared. My peers do it with the teacher's help. Alex Tell them the guy whose fault when Dussy as a trend is is begging them to stop. I have lost control. I see it everywhere. People send me meme accounts that are posting about it, and they don't follow me. I don't know what's happening. I'm scared. So, yes, I feel it, too. Just pl please. I am haunted <laughs> by the, the, the consequences of my actions. So. You know, you know what the consequences of your actions are, Aiden. The consequences of your actions are ten percent of my comments. Yeah. Probably contain the word windowsy in there somewhere. I'm sorry. And I just so happen to have a podcast with the guy who started it. So isn't isn't fate just a pickle thing? Isn't that funny how that works? The Lord works in mysterious ways. This ain't God. Don't this get don't do God. that to this him. Is Satan. <laughs> this is the work of the it's devil. You. This is you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't load don't offload this his teacher found my channel as an explanation mm. there you go free free marketing you, free alex, advertising alex you can clip this alex's teacher please i'm begging you do not expose the children to the wendussy <laughs> they know not what they seek thank you all for watching we'll see you on the next one <laughs>